Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs will come to order. Today's hearing, again, is in a hybrid format. Our witnesses in person. Thank you, Chair Powell. Members have the option to appear either in person or virtually. I want to start by acknowledging that as we sit here this morning, Ukrainians are showing such courage and resolve fighting Russian invaders in their homelands. Ukrainian families fleeing indiscriminate bombings or taking refuge in subway tunnels something Europe hasn't seen since the Siege of London seven decades ago. I express my support for the brave men and women in Ukraine fighting for democracy. I know my colleagues on this committee of both parties join me in that. It's a Russian attack on democracy. It's only the latest terrible escalation of, of, of what has become one of the main goals of the Russian Federation to attack and undermine democratic norms at home and abroad. The world is looking at us right now. We're the leader of the free world. It's oldest democracy. It's vital. We live by our values, both abroad and at home. It means a commitment to the rule of law, a commitment to democratic participation, a commitment to independent institutions that are allow our society to function like the Federal Reserve. We created the Fed 109 years ago, I guess, an independent agency, as an independent agency outside of any political party's control to be staffed with economic experts, not political cronies. It's one of many American institutions that sets our country apart from autocratic regimes. It's vital we reaffirm our commitment to the Fed's role, showing the world what a functioning democracy looks, looks like. Let's show up and do our jobs, like Chair Powell comes here perhaps 14 times a year, it seems to him. Uh, that's the best way to achieve a strong, growing economy that lifts up the whole country. This time last year, our country and our economy were at a place of deep uncertainty. Four million Americans out of a job, frontline workers just beginning to get vaccinated. We were in the midst of a public health crisis, an economic crisis that needed all of us, policymakers, business owners, workers, union and non-union alike, to come together and tackle the challenge of this pandemic economy. It's what we did. We passed the American Rescue Plan. We got shots into arms, money in people's pockets, workers back on the job, kids back in school. Against the odds, 2021 became a year of, as the chair, I'm sure will say, unprecedented economic growth for our country and job creation, wage gains, GDP for the first time in two decades. Think about this. First time in two decades, our economy grew faster than China's economy. Think about that. We averaged a half million new jobs per month last year. We saw the fastest drop ever in the unemployment rate. Wages rose for workers, especially low-wage workers who began to have a little more power in a tight labor market. American entrepreneurs broke. Uh, American entrepreneurs started a record setting five million new businesses. This translated into American families' household balance sheets healthier in 21 than before the pandemic. It's because of the actions that Democrats took in this Congress, expanding the child tax credit, rental assistance, housing assistance. The American Rescue Plan helped get most Americans vaccinated, made a booster shot available to everyone. 65% of the population is fully vaccinated, more than 75% of all adults. Case counts, hospitalizations are dropping. We're one step closer to normal life beyond the pandemic. Americans no longer have to live in fear. We've come a long way, but the fight isn't over. It's taken a terrible toll on Americans after two years of stress, of massive disruptions in our lives and our economy. People are simply exhausted. They're fearful that inflation will make it harder and harder for them to keep up with the cost of living. The economy, the pandemic economy has caused inflation. Families feel it at the gas station. They feel it when they're making rent payments. They feel it when they check out, check out at the grocery store. We must acknowledge that Russians' invasion of Ukraine will affect the global economy. We learned over the past two years how fragile our supply chain, global supply chains are. Some of us have said for years we should make more things in America and rely less on China. Elites in Washington in lobbying for trade laws, trade change and trade law and tax law. Elites in Washington dismissed those concerns. For decades now, they're starting to wake up. We help prevent long-term inflation by bringing supply chains home. In the process, we rebuild our own industrial base. The House and Senate have both passed bills investing in domestic manufacturing and research and development. We need to put a comprehensive bill on the president's desk. We need to bring manufacturing, research, and development back to this country. We're building the capacity to move goods faster and more cheaply with the bipartisan infrastructure bill. While most Americans report mixed feelings about the economy over the past year, they may have gotten a raise in a tax cut and have more in savings, 
while also being concerned, rightly, about rising costs, there's one group that did better than ever last year, America's large corporations. Corporations made record profits in 2021. They gave their executives and their shareholders a bigger slice of the profits than ever. They've reacted with barely controlled glee at the opportunity to raise prices during this pandemic economy. We can never forget raising prices as a choice. There's no law saying if the cost of an input goes up or transportation costs increase, companies have to raise prices. They have options. They could cut costs elsewhere by making executive bonuses or stock buybacks just a little bit smaller. Of course they don't. There's not enough competition in the economy, especially drug companies, meat packers, oil companies, shippers. From the meat packing industry, the oil cartels, corporations don't face the fair capitalist free market competition we need to keep prices low and wages high. And when you combine current inflation with the expenses that have been rising for decades, drug costs, childcare, housing, it's little wonder that many middle class families in Nevada and Massachusetts and South Carolina and Alabama and Pennsylvania and Ohio don't feel stable. It will take all of us to lower these long-term costs, fight inflation, create an economy where hard work pays off for everyone, no matter who you are, where you live, what kind of work you do. All workers should be able to find a good paying job that allows them to raise a family, keep up with the cost of living, join the middle class. The Federal Reserve has the responsibility, as you know, Mr. Chair, to tackle inflation, to ensure we have a resilient labor market, a safe and stable banking system, an official and reliable, an efficient and reliable payment system, and empowered local communities where consumers and workers and small banks and small businesses thrive. It's more important than ever that we have a full, full means seven members, first time in a decade. You only have four now, as you know, a full Federal Reserve making those decisions. In a time of deep, deep economic uncertainty where democracies around the world are threatened by authoritarian strongmen, we must ensure the Fed's operating at full capacity. We have an opportunity, Mr. Chair, as you know, and you know her well, to confirm one of the world's leading experts on cybersecurity and the financial system. Sarah Bloom Raskin chaired the G7 Cyber Export Group. We need her in that position now more than ever. All of us need to do our job to get her and the other four Fed noms confirmed. We must fill these positions so the entire team of decision makers can come together, assess the data, address the problems America faces. We have a chair pro tempore of the Federal Reserve, Jay Powell, here to deliver a biennial update on the Fed's actions to steer economic recovery. Chair Powell, thank you. Look forward to your testimony. Senator Toomey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me begin by uh, fully endorsing the sentiments you expressed regarding the appalling Russian invasion of an entirely, entirely unjustified war against Ukraine and share uh, your salute for the extraordinary courage, valor, uh, and commitment of the people of Ukraine. Uh, Chairman Powell, welcome. Uh, I do hope we process your nomination soon. Of course, I've been advocating that we do that for some time now. But in the meantime, I do know that you and your fellow FOMC members are fully able to do your job of fighting inflation. And obviously, there's a lot of work to do on that front. January's inflation reached a 40-year high of 7.5%. And inflation like that is doing real damage to average Americans. Um, some of my colleagues like to observe that wages are growing. Problem is inflation is growing faster. And that causes workers to fall further and further behind. And that's what's happening today. Savers, of course, are earning virtually zero on their savings, while inflation significantly erodes the value of those savings. Our current zero interest rate monetary policy that we've had for some time now it is probably appropriate at a period of economic crisis or during a recession. It's hard to see that that makes sense during a period of multi-decade high inflation. Of course, profligate fiscal policy of the last year has also contributed to inflation. Democrats, supporters of blowout deficit spending bills like the American Rescue Plan and Build Back Better have looked to blame others for the consequences of their own misguided policy. First, they blame global supply chains. Now they've shifted their blame to greedy corporations. Uh, actually, inflation is pretty easy to understand. It results from more money chasing fewer goods. The administration's policies, such as overregulation and a war on American energy, have limited the production of goods. And meanwhile, reckless spending has resulted in more money chasing those goods. Of course, the Fed's accommodative monetary policy has further stimulated demand. 
For several years now, I've warned that it could be extremely difficult to put the inflation genie back in the bottle. Well, the genie is out, and the Fed is behind the curve. We need to act with urgency to get inflation under control. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm also deeply uh, troubled by what appears to be a growing urge to use financial regulators in general and the Fed in particular to tackle complex political questions that are outside of our financial and monetary system. Questions like how and how quickly to transition to a lower carbon economy. Questions like how to address racially charged social issues. Or even how do we improve primary and secondary education. Now, there's no doubt these are very important issues but they're wholly unrelated to the Fed's limited statutory mandates and expertise. And yet the Fed has been weighing in on every one of these issues. Some intend to use the Fed's recently developed climate scenario analysis as a mechanism, as, as part of a tool to steer capital away from carbon intensive industries. All 12 reserve banks have hosted a racism in the economy series where invited speakers advocated for specific policies, including racial reparations and defunding the police, among other very liberal proposals. And the Minneapolis Fed is actively lobbying to change Minnesota's constitution on the issue of K-12 education policy. But does anyone really think that these activities are within the Fed's statutory mandates? Of course not. What they are is they're challenging and complex issues that require really difficult trade-offs. And in a democratic society, those trade-offs have to be made by elected representatives who are directly accountable to the American people. Can think about, consider some trade-offs associated with addressing global warming. Now, if we limit domestic oil and gas production, Americans will pay more at the pump. How much more is appropriate? If we suddenly limit domestic production without feasible energy alternatives, our nation and the world will become more reliant on fossil fuels from autocratic nations. We're watching that play out. When does that reliance present an unacceptable national and global security threat? These are just examples of an unlimited number of equally challenging trade-offs for all of these politically charged topics, none of which should be decided by unelected and unaccountable central bankers. And yet some of the reserve banks are diving right in. And when I've requested additional information about their activities, the Reserve Bank stonewall me. When I ask the board to address the issue, everyone passes the buck. The Fed board says, oh, those things are up to the Reserve Banks, even though the board oversees the Reserve Banks. And except through the Fed board, the Reserve Banks are completely unaccountable to Congress. So when I think about this state of affairs, Mr. Chairman, I can only conclude that we need to think seriously about reforming the structure of the Fed. In my view, any Fed reform should preserve and strengthen monetary policy independence but it should also develop mechanisms to enforce the existing statutory limits on Federal Reserve activity that are not being complied with today. That would require also proper congressional oversight by increasing transparency. So here are three reform ideas that we ought to discuss. First, unlike the main Fed board, the reserve banks are not subject to FOIA. Well, that should change. Second, we should consider whether or not to subject Federal Reserve bank heads, the, the regional reserve bank heads, to presidential appointment and Senate confirmation. Third, we ought to examine the historical 12 reserve bank structure. That dates back to a very, very different time. For example, it might make sense to consolidate them into five banks and make each one a permanent voter on the FOMC. Or maybe we should eliminate the reserve banks entirely and have the main Fed board assume these responsibilities. To be clear, I'm not specifically advocating any one of these, but I think we have to consider these and other possibilities. I don't present these ideas lightly, but the Fed was given independence to insulate monetary policy from politics, and Congress has a responsibility to ensure that the Fed does not become a political actor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Toomey. Uh, Mr. Powell, we welcome you to the committee again as Chair Pro Tempore of the Federal Reserve. Please begin your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Toomey, and other members of the committee, I'm pleased to present the Federal Reserve's semi-annual monetary policy report. Before I begin, let me briefly address Russia's attack on Ukraine. The conflict is causing tremendous hardship for the Ukrainian people, 
The implications for the U.S. economy are highly uncertain, and we will be monitoring the situation closely. At the Fed, we're strongly committed to achieving the monetary policy goals that Congress has given us, maximum employment and price stability. We pursue these goals based solely on data and objective analysis, and we're committed to doing so in a clear and transparent manner so that the American people and their representatives in Congress understand our policy actions and can hold us accountable. I will review the current economic situation before turning to monetary policy. Economic activity expanded at a robust 5.5% pace last year, reflecting progress on vaccinations and the reopening of the economy, fiscal and monetary support, and the healthy financial positions of households and businesses. The rapid spread of the Omicron variant led to some slowing in economic activity early this year, but with cases having declined sharply since mid-January, the slowdown seems to have been brief. The labor market is extremely tight. Payroll employment rose by 6.7 million in 2021, and job gains were robust in January. The unemployment rate declined substantially over the past year and stood at 4% in January, reaching the median of FOMC participants' estimates of its longer run normal level. The improvements in labor market conditions have been widespread, including for workers at the lower end of the wage distribution, as well as for African Americans and Hispanics. Labor demand is very strong, and while labor force participation has ticked up, labor supply remains subdued. As a result, employers are having difficulties filling job openings, an unprecedented number of workers are quitting to take new jobs, and wages are rising at their fastest pace in many years. Inflation increased sharply last year and is now running well above our longer run objective of 2%. Demand is strong and bottlenecks and supply constraints are limiting how quickly production can respond. These supply disruptions have been larger and longer lasting than anticipated, exacerbated by waves of the virus, and price increases are now spreading to a broader range of goods and services. We understand that high inflation imposes significant hardship especially on those least able to meet the higher costs of essentials, like food, housing, and transportation. We know that the best thing we can do to support a strong labor market is to promote a long expansion, and that is only possible in an environment of price stability. The committee will continue to monitor incoming economic data and will adjust the stance of monetary policy as appropriate to manage risks that could impede the attainment of its goals. The committee's assessments will take into account a wide range of information, including labor market conditions, inflation pressures and inflation expectations, and financial and international developments. We continue to expect inflation to decline over the course of the year as supply constraints ease and demand moderates because of the waning effects of fiscal support and the removal of monetary policy accommodation. But we are attentive to the risks of potential further upward pressure on inflation expectations and inflation itself from a number of factors. We will use our policy tools as appropriate to prevent higher inflation from becoming entrenched while promoting a sustainable expansion in a strong labor market. Our monetary policy has been adapting to the evolving economic environment and it will continue to do so. We have phased out our net asset purchases with inflation well above 2% and a strong labor market. We expect it'll be appropriate to raise the target range for the federal funds rate at our meeting later this month. The process of removing policy accommodation in current circumstances will involve both increases in the target range of the federal funds rate and reduction in the size of the Fed's balance sheet. As the FOMC noted in January, federal funds rate is our primary means of adjusting the stance of monetary policy. Reducing our balance sheet will commence after the process of raising interest rates has begun and will proceed in a predictable manner, primarily through adjustments to reinvestments. The near-term effects on the U.S. economy of the invasion of Ukraine, the ongoing war, the sanctions, and of events to come remain highly uncertain. Making appropriate monetary policy in this environment requires a recognition that the economy evolves in unexpected ways. We'll need to be nimble in responding to incoming data and the evolving outlook. Maintaining the trust and confidence of the public is essential to our work. Last month, the Federal Reserve finalized a comprehensive set of new ethics rules to substantially strengthen the investment restrictions for senior Federal Reserve officials. 
These new rules will guard against even the appearance of any conflict of interest. They are tough and best in class in government here and around the world. We understand that our actions affect communities, families, and businesses across the country. Everything we do is in service to our public mission. We at the Fed will do everything we can to achieve our maximum employment and price stability goals. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Paul. Uh, we, of course, are, are monitoring closely Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the impacts it will have on our partners, including our country. Uh, in November, the Fed issued a rule jointly with OCC and FDIC to require banks to notify their financial, their federal financial regulator of any cybersecurity incident within 36 hours. There had already been the requirement of notification, but you, you sped that up, obviously. Given the increased threat of cyber attacks, expeditious reporting by inst financial institutions is essential. How does the Fed address any reporting about cyber attacks when they occur? What do you do? When we receive reports, well, f first of all, we to date we have not uh, seen any significant uh, issues, uh, but we remain uh, vigilant. In, you know that that uh, since the Ukraine war began, um, so we're in constant, ongoing contact with the financial institutions, especially the large ones, on cyber risk, and particularly in this environment, we have been since a couple of months ago on very high alert. So are they? It's regular communication. Uh, back and forth, the channels are open, and and all of us are on on the highest stage of alert, as you would as you would imagine. I think it's important. I know that uh, your 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 focus is always on financial institutions. It's important for us to be able to repel cyber attacks to protect against them. That throughout our economy, businesses are reporting cyber attacks on though them. And your your job is obviously with financial institutions. I'm hopeful that you will make those comments increasingly public uh, so that other businesses understand, while you don't have jurisdiction, that other businesses understand the importance of that. Uh, we know the impact of Russia's invasion could go beyond cyber attacks on financial institutions. It's possible because of his actions. Prices of commodities could go up given any market disruptions and Americans could see higher prices in the grocery store or the gas pump. How, is the, how does the Fed, Mr. Chair, evaluate the economic uncertainty caused by Putin's actions? What steps do you take to mitigate those risks like inflation? You know, so we're watching carefully to see how this evolves. I think to your point, the, um, the ultimate effects on the U.S. economy of, of, uh, of the war, of the sanctions and of events yet to come is, is highly uncertain. And so we need to be alert to what those might be. I think we, what, what we know so far is that commodity prices have moved up significantly, energy prices in particular. That's going to work its way through our U.S. economy. We're going to see uh, upward pressure on inflation, at least for a while. We don't know how long that will be sustained for. In addition, um, uh, we, we could see uh, you know, uh, risk sentiment declining, risk-taking sentiment declining. So you could see lower investment. You could see people holding back on spending. It's, it's hard to say what the effects on both supply and demand uh, will be. Uh, and I, I would just echo that we, we need to be alert and nimble as we, as we uh, make de de decisions in, a, in what is a quite a difficult environment. The, the monetary policy report uh, that you released highlighted great news for workers in our economic recovery, wage gains across the board, but especially for low-wage workers, job growth across sectors, a drop in the unemployment rate that beat forecasters' expectations, all good news. We, though, clearly have a long way to go when it comes to making sure everyone has a good quality job. We know from prior economic crises that hiking up interest rates, and I know you will be cautious, but hiking up interest rates too early can depress job growth. Uh, my question is, as the Fed plans to raise interest rates, what, feds, what steps will you take to ensure that it doesn't affect the pretty amazing job growth. President Biden mentioned at the State of the Union, 369,000 manufacturing jobs, many of them in my state of Ohio. Uh, how do you ensure that the, the, the Fed steps the Fed takes don't, infect, don't affect that kind of job growth? Well, so the labor market as we have it today, unemployment's down to 4%, and wages are at um, historic highs for recent history, uh, quits are at a, at a 
you know, all time highs or near that. Job openings are at all time highs. So this is this is a, you're right. This is a great labor market for workers, particularly workers at the at the lower in the lower quartile of earning, uh, who are getting the biggest wage increases and really a very very high wage increases. So um, the problem really that we're facing is one of high inflation. And uh, over time, those people that, you know, the, the biggest risk to being able to sustain uh, a long expansion and have continued increases in participation, for example, which has tended to lag declines in unemployment, is to, is to sustain or really restore price stability. So that, that is the single most important thing we can do to, to really uh, try, to, try to have the kind of long expansion that we saw in the last cycle and saw the many benefits that, that flowed to people uh, as that expansion expansion extended. Thank you. And my last um, 60 seconds, uh, two yes or no questions, if I could. Do you agree that making testing and vaccinations accessible has already made it possible for people to safely rejoin the labor force? Um, I don't have any special expertise on that, but that sounds right to me. Do you agree that making child care affordable would make it possible for parents to return to work and increase the labor supply? I, as we've, I think, discussed, there's, there's good research that su supports that proposition as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, Senator Toomey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Chairman Powell, just to, so that we get this on, on the record here, um, a couple of just quick, simple questions here. Um, monetary policy is decided by the FOMC of the Fed, correct? Yes. Uh, and there are 12 seats on the FOMC, of which nine are currently filled, correct? Actually, there are as many as 19 participants, but you're right. There can be 12 voters. Right now, so we have right now 16 of the 19 seats filled or 9 of the 12 voters. Okay. So the FOMC is today, right now, fully capable of determining monetary policy, and the Fed as a whole is fully capable of implementing that policy right now. Is that correct? Yes, we will, we will do our jobs. Okay. Okay. Um, I was glad to hear your emphasis on the importance of price stability. Here's my concern. You know, it's a little bit easier to raise interest rates, to normalize, to fight inflation at a time when the economy is booming. What I'm a little bit worried about, and, and I fully acknowledge nobody knows how this is going to play out, but I think it's fair to say that this war has changed the risk profile a little bit with respect to inflation, as you just alluded to. There's certainly some upward pressure on energy and maybe beyond. And all else being equal, it probably increases the risk that we'll be looking at downward revisions in growth. Not, nothing certain about that, but the risk is higher. And so I wonder if you could share with us your thoughts on the importance of fighting inflation if we find ourselves in a situation where growth is less robust than what we're hoping for now. So I, I would agree on both the supply and demand side, there's a lot of uncertainty. The oil prices are, gonna, are, are, are higher. That typically does weigh on spending to some extent. But at the same time, we have households and businesses that are in such strong financial shape where it's not clear what those, what those effects are going to be. Um, so as I, as I mentioned yesterday, I, I do think that it, it's going to be appropriate for us to continue to proceed along the lines that we had in mind before the uh, Ukraine invasion happened, and that was to uh, to raise interest rates at the at the March meeting, and to continue through the course of the year, based on incoming data and the evolving outlook, to engage in a series of, of rates. I, I would say, in this very sensitive time at the moment, I think it's appropriate for us to be careful in the way we conduct policy, um, because simply because things are so uncertain, and we don't want to add to that uncertainty. But that's where it leaves me. I just hope that um, that the the actual practice going forward at the Fed is consistent with what I think you were alluding to earlier, and that is the need for price stability as a precondition for maximizing the well-being of American workers. Uh, if we're in a world where we don't have price stability, they don't have job security, they don't have income security. It's it's just so important. I, I sure hope that we exceed all of our ex expectations about growth this year, but I don't know that. Let me shift uh, to ask you this. In your view, is it consistent with the statutory mandate of the regional Fed banks to engage in political advocacy and specifically a racial justice campaign or efforts to amend a state constitution? Is, is that in the, within the proper domain of regional Fed banks? 
So as we've discussed, you know, we, the reserve banks have generally had and exercised a degree of freedom of oversight from the board, the Board of Governors, in their research activities, in their policy thinking activities. And that has always been thought to be a benefit, including by me, uh, because it, it, it avoids uh, the kind of group think you could get if you had one uh, economic staff in one building and that's where all the governors were. So it's been a feature rather than a bug of the system for a long time. I, I would, though, I would echo, though, I strongly share the view that everything we do in the system needs to be clearly linked in ways that people understand to our mandate and that that is one of the very most important uh, underpinnings of our independence. If, if, we're, if, we're, if we're not doing that, then the case for our independence immediately becomes weaker, so. Yeah, uh, yeah, and, and I, don't, I don't think anybody can make the case that amending a state constitution with respect to how a state pays for primary and secondary education has anything to do with that mandate. Let me ask you the last question. Um, the Fed has embraced the idea of requiring climate scenario analyses for banks, and the justification is this is an important way for banks to understand the nature of the risk that they face. Um, whatever one thinks of that, is it your view that among the Fed's responsibilities is to determine the pace at which the American economy transitions to a lower carbon economy? No. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Senator Tester of Montana is recognized. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, ranking member. And I want to thank uh, Chairman Powell for being here today. I appreciate the work that you do as always. Um, look, um, in, I think inflation's on everybody's minds and how you deal with it. And as you pointed out the last time you were in front of this committee, it's not only a demand problem, it's a supply problem. You can help deal with the demand, but the supplies issue are, are a little different thing. Being in the business of agriculture, personally, I can see that consolidation in the marketplace is a big deal. I'm talking particularly uh, the meat industry right now where you have four packers who control 84% of this country's meat supply. Competition is critically important if capitalism is going to work. I don't need to tell you that. You know that better than anybody. But, but it doesn't seem like there's a lot of competition in a number of different areas, but I'll just focus on on, uh, on, on, on meat packing. Um, so, no, no, I won't. Let me back up. Uh, let's talk about consolidation generally, and if that helps drive prices up or down, and then if you could, uh, if, if, if in fact you think it does uh, drive prices up, uh, would inserting more competition in the marketplace help Consumers. So, um, first of all, we don't we're not responsible for competition policy, and a no. lot of these questions, uh, in individual industries can, can have, you know, uh, competition issues, and those are appropriate subjects for the for the folks who wield those tools. That's that's not us. Um, at the at the aggregate level, um, the the connection between concentration, for example, and inflation is is really not clear. Some of the most some of the industries that had a lot of consolidation were the very ones that drove low inflation over the last 25 years. You know, retail and wholesale consolidated a whole bunch and, and a bunch of technology went in. That's where, that, that was very high productivity and very low inflation. So um, it's not obvious. It, but again, industry by industry, there will be cases in which there are comp competition issues, and those are certainly an appropriate uh, subject for, for, you know, antitrust scrutiny. Um as is, is, is we look um, as we look at the, at the, at the war in, in Ukraine, as we look at um, inflation that uh, is occurring here in this country, um, and I know you're chairman of the Fed, and I know that if these are areas that you might not want to get into, but, but, but I will ask anyway. You can always decline to answer. And that is... is are there certain things we should be doing right now or paying particular attention to in the in the inflation realm? In particular, I'm sorry, in, in, in the in, sense in, of... In, in sense from a congressional standpoint, uh, are things we should be paying particular attention to to try to free up? Now, so let me, I don't want you to answer the question for you, but I think trucking's a big issue in this country right now. I think being able to get products in and out of this country is a big, is a big issue right now from a shipping standpoint. Uh, 
should we be looking at those kind of things? Should we be looking at other things? I, I, do, I do think that over time, there, there are certainly things that, that Congress could do. I, th I think in the near term, really it's down to the private sector and um, you know, the supply chains and things like that getting untangled, getting fixed, and it's, it's down to us doing our jobs uh, with our tools. Um, but but I, I would agree, though, that um, you know, we need more labor supply. Um, we, we need more semiconductors and things like that. We cl clearly, you mentioned trucking. Um, uh, we're, we're short workers right now in, in, a, in a way that other, we had a shock to participation that's much larger than in any, any other country. And there, there must be ways to address that, although uh, it's, it's, some of that is voluntary, uh, clearly on the, on the part of people who've you know, decided to retire and things like that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Shelby is recognized from Alabama. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Powell, welcome again to the committee. You spent a lot of time with us here. Um, you're the chairman of the Federal Reserve. We have this hearing now before the United States Senate Banking Committee, but millions of people around the world are watching this hearing and watching what you say and also what you do at the Fed. Uh, Let's talk some more about price stability because I think that's so important. We know what the term is, but to the average person, just explain what you mean by price stability, which is a mandate of the Congress gives the Fed. So we, we think of price stability as uh, having inflation that is 2%, right around 2%, but it may be a, a Clear Sta away. Stable prices, stable everything, right? Yes, and but really, what it means is that people can go about their daily lives without thinking much about inflation. It comes down to that, and that it's just not an important consideration for people living their lives, taking out mortgages, putting their kids through school, or for businesses that are borrowing and things like that. It affects everybody in the economy just about. Doesn't it does, it? and one when, way or the other. And when and when inflation is goes up, you're, and you're seeing this now. Real wages, really, what, what matters is whether your wages are going up more or less than inflation. And for the most part, real wages are, are, are declining, uh, but not for everybody. I think at the bottom end of the wage spectrum, real wages have actually been increasing. But, and that's why we need to get inflation under control. It's going to be harder to get it under control once it's rampant than it would be when you, it starts out. My question to you is this. We, we know you have a lot of great gifted economists at the Federal Reserve that furnish you data on every trend on prices and price that would tend, dealing with inflation, price stability in the world and how it affects us here, everybody. The Fed obviously missed the, the trends there. Was it a question of not having the right data or was it a question of ignoring the data you had because a lot of private, uh, I wouldn't say all, but a lot of private economists predicted where we're going on this inflation, and they were spot on two years ago. Uh, was it a question of, again, you didn't have the data, which you should have, or you, you misjudged the data or ignored the data? No, no, it's, it was not about data at all. This, this is really what it was about. Uh -huh. when, when inflation really just about barely a year ago, in March of last mm. year, started to move up quickly, central banks and macroeconomists really overwhelmingly looked at that as like a supply shock, like an oil shock. And what the textbook says is the shock's going to come and it's going to go, and, and you shouldn't react to it. It'll, and, and so that's, we, we looked at it that way. And I would say f f by, by the middle of last year, um, uh, we started to move away from it, and we, we moved away from it at an increasing rate of speed. Hindsight says we should have moved earlier and, and that that turned out to be wrong. Not, not maybe conceptually wrong, but it's just taking so much longer for the supply side to heal than we thought. So in hindsight, you sh sh certainly wouldn't have, have done that, but I think we were, we were there, there, there really is no precedent for this. We looked at it the way it was. There were, there were certainly some voices, and they, they've turned out to be right so far. Ultimately, we think the supply side will improve and that'll help with inflation. In the meantime, we're gonna use our tools and we're gonna get this done. About 40 years ago or more, you know, we had rampant inflation in the US. We had a uh, chairman, Dr. Volcker, who was chairman of the Fed, 
and he was uh, maligned for a little while by people, but praised later. Uh, but uh, he brought the leadership to the Fed and to the country that we had to squeeze inflation out at, at, at all costs, just about. And a lot of it was draconian. You have to do it. It's the leadership at the Fed under you and the Fed prepared to do what it takes to get inflation under control uh, and protect price stability? Well, let me say I knew Paul Volcker. I, I'm pretty sure I saw him testify in this room many years ago. I think he was one of the great public servants of the era, the greatest economic public servant what? of the era. And I hope history will re record that the answer to your question is yes. So you're, at, you're, you're prepared to do what it takes without any reservation to uh, protect price stability. Yes. That would be a departure of what you've done. Thank you very much. Senator Menendez from New Jersey is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Biden administration, in coordination with U.S. allies around the world, has placed historic sanctions on Russia in response to the invasion of Ukraine. In particular, uh, particular sanctions on the Russian central bank cutting off its access to international reserves, I believe will have a powerful effect on Putin and the elites who have reaped the benefits of his repressive regime. Sanctions are one of our most important foreign policy tools, but it isn't always easy to understand just how effective they can be. So Chairman Powell, can you explain in <clears throat> layman terms the effect of sanctions imposed on the Russian central bank? Sure, I should start though by saying that um, Everyone should know that we don't implement sanctions. Those are really the province of the elected government and the Treasury Department. We, all we do is we're sort of there in the background to I understand. the technical back, backstop and that I kind understand. of thing. I just want to use your expertise for... Sure. So the, you know, the, what the central bank does is um, when... So different currencies in different countries uh, are, are traded all day long and, all, and in some cases all night long around the globe. And, you know, the... Uh, the value of those currencies really matters for people when they're trying to buy something. For example, if you're trying to buy an American car or American radio or an Apple iPhone, it'll be priced in dollars. So the ruble uh, weakened dramatically uh, through this, which is the Russian currency. And what those sanctions do is make it very difficult for the, for the Central Bank of Russia to do its job, which is to support the, the uh, the ruble on behalf of the government, and it's because the the, the the sort of resources that it had to support the ruble were, were tied up in a way that made it difficult for them to do that. That's part of it. Yeah, and those uh, sanctions means that Putin can access hundreds of millions in international reserves that he could use to continue to fund his war effort. Is that is that correct? Well, yes, may, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let me ask you uh, this. Uh, as the economy continues to recover, uh, we've had a lot of conversation here about managing inflation as a key challenge. Uh, the first step to, to do so, in my mind, is to confirm the five highly qualified nominees President Biden has selected for the Federal Reserve Board, including yourself. And I hope uh, our Republican colleagues will allow us to do that soon. The next and more challenging step is to address the supply crisis that is driving up uh, much of this inflation. Can you give us a brief update on how persistent supply chain issues are disrupting the recovery and contributing to inflation? Sure. So a, a lot of the inflation we're seeing is coming from imported goods or manufactured goods that contain imported content. content and the price of shipping, for example, internationally has, has gone up quite a lot. And there are long delays and the ports are full because demand is really so high. It's, it's, it's a demand problem as well as a supply, supply problem. And, you know, we've been feeling very small amounts of, of progress on that. I have to say one of the a little bit unexpected uh, byproducts of, of the Ukraine war is it, it, it's looking like uh, supply chains. It, it's not going to help at all with supply chains because ships are not being offloaded and um, things like that. So there are unanticipated or unexpected effects of what we're doing, which isn't to say we shouldn't do them. So we're, we're want, we can't we can't. This is not something we have any expertise in fixing, but we've been waiting for, for that to happen, and it hasn't happened. We haven't seen much relief on the supply side. The other thing is the supply of labor. Um, you know, demand, there's no problem with labor demand. We have really the ratio of, of job openings to um, 
unemployed is at the highest, by far the highest level it's ever been, more than 1.7 open jobs per unemployed person. So we have a labor supply problem. We think that getting past the pandemic will really help with that. Uh, and of course, higher wages should help bring people in too. Yeah. So would strengthening supply chains and resolving bottlenecks help to combat inflation in the long term? Certainly in the near term, it would. It, it, I, would I would think it would be a, certainly a good thing. Um, and, uh, you know, we passed the Strategic Competition and Innovation Act last May, and the House now has its own provisions. Uh, I'm looking forward to a reconciliation of that because that would address bottlenecks, strengthen our supply chains and going forward, including food, uh, funding to boost domestic production of semiconductors and my supply chain database provision as well. Finally, you just mentioned uh, uh, labor. We're facing a dire labor shortage across the country, which is holding back our economy. The Fed's monetary policy report from last week noted that, quote, labor supply has been slow to rebound, even as labor demand has been remarkably strong. There are currently 11 million job openings nationwide. Immigrants are ready and willing to fill many of those jobs. Would you say uh, that if we had a process in which we could uh, bring those immigrants out of the shadows into the light, uh, have them go through a process, criminal background check, and make sure they paid their taxes, that the role of immigrants in mitigating the current labor shortage and rising inflation would be a significant one? Saying that we, we don't do immigration policy, as an arithmetic fact, uh, the immigration has been um, much lower and accounts for a, a, you know, a meaningful part of the labor shortfall. And that's why leading business groups agree with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Menendez. Senator Crapo uh, from Idaho is, uh, joins us from his office. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Chair Powell, thank you for being with us today. I wanted to start uh, first by following up on some of the uh, line of questioning that Senator Toomey raised. Uh, just a couple of quick questions in terms of the ability to manage the Fed and its ability to operate right now. Uh, it, it is correct that you were recently named by the Federal Reserve Board as the chairman pro tem pending the handling of your nomination. Is that correct? Yes. And in that capacity, you have the full ability to chair the board while we wait for the handling of your nomination. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Uh, I want to make it very clear. I hope that we handle your nomination soon, and uh, I intend to vote in support of it. But I just wanted to also make it clear that you are fully functioning as the chair now as the, in the capacity of chair pro tem. And it's also correct that you were named in January by the Federal Reserve Board as the chairman of the FOMC. That's correct also? Actually, I was elected by the FOMC to be chair. Okay, you were elected by the FOMC. Yes. All right. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> and let me move on to just one other aspect of it. Uh, you've already discussed the dual mandate of the Fed today, uh, the low and stable in inflation rate uh, and maximum employment. Disturbingly to me, there are some who are suggesting that the Federal Reserve should, in addition to that, or even to claim it as a part of that, that the Federal Reserve should uh, stop so-called suboptimal industries from having access to capital, either to restrict their access to capital or to deprive their access to capital. Uh, do you believe that any kind of standard such as that should be something that the Federal Reserve Board should pursue in its supervisory capacity? No, I do not. All right. I appreciate that because this is this is a disturbing trend that has come in a number of different contexts over the last few years. And, and the notion that we should utilize our federal regulatory and supervision authorities to decide which industries are optimal and uh, restrict those that we don't like politically from access to capital is a very alarming uh, idea that I think America should reject quickly. Uh, finally, I just have one more question. Uh, obviously, with related to Ukraine uh, and the, the issue of oil and energy markets has come to the forefront as a result of a number of different aspects, whether it's sanctioned questions or whether it is simply the issues of, of depriving uh, Russia access to the utilization of Nord Stream uh, and many other aspects. Do you expect that the strains on the oil or energy markets that we will see coming out of this war uh, will act to push inflation even higher or will act as, a, as an impediment to our ability to get inflation under control? In the near term, 
uh, and we already see this, uh, oil prices are up, you know, substantially from where they were two months, three months ago, and that will get into gasoline prices and other uh, fuel prices, and that will show up in higher inflation. The question really is what will be the extent of those, uh, and even more important, what will be their persistence? So typically with an oil spike, uh, prices go up and, and they either stay at that level or they go down. In either of those cases, they, they add to the price level, but not to inflation. Um, it's really, um, the concern though is there's already a lot of upward inflation pressure and additional inflation pressure does probably raise at the margin the risk that inflation expectations will start to react in a way that is, uh, uh, that is negative for controlling inflation. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Crapo. Senator uh, Warner from Virginia is recognized from his office. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Chair Powell, it's great to see you at least uh, remotely. Uh, I want to pick up where my, or at least point out, because I want to move to Ukraine where my, my friend Senator Crapo raised some of the issues. Um, it is obviously the responsibility of the Fed as we looking at the economy to uh, evaluate systemic risk to the economy, is it not? Yes. Thank you. And and you and others have testified that uh, whether we call it uh, climate change, sea level rise, um, you know, dramatic changes in weather that brings about flooding, storms, name it, um, that is appropriate for review. And while obviously the, the terminology of designating a particular industry, I agree, shouldn't be. But the systemic risk, I, I think, are critically important, and I appreciate the fact that you've recognized that. And I think we need to continue to recognize that. And we, we, we live through that uh, literally. If we look at the, the number of natural disasters, from fires in the West to floods in my state or or floods in the, the South, um, it is it is here to stay. Uh, I want to talk about um, the chair of the Intel Committee, and um, very very concerned about. Um, it's happening in Ukraine. I'm very proud of the fact that the administration has worked in concert with our European allies rather than acting solo. And uh, I was 11 days ago in, in Munich, and if you would have told me 11 days later that the Europeans would have uh, used SWIFT, shut down Nord Stream 2, um, Germany would have changed its complete position on, on f funding arms, Sweden, Finland, we would have sanctioned um, Putin. I think all terribly important to have a Western response to this aggression. Um, on the SWIFT issue, I think it's good. I, I do think we need to get our European allies as well to sanction some of the smaller banks as we have. I think we also need to look at non-SWIFT abilities of, of transfer. And I am concerned that I, the chairman and Senator Warren and Senator Reid and I have um, are very concerned about some of the leakage that could be taking place through cryptocurrencies. Uh, I think there is a great deal of value in, in ultimately uh, uh, digital-based currencies, um, but the concern I have is that crypto exchanges, DeFi, I mean, there's a stat I got the other day that was, I thought was very impressive, 7,000 stocks uh, on our public markets, 17,000 different crypto tokens on crypto exchanges, literally a million crypto tokens being developed in decentralized finance. And I know this is not directly, this is more Secretary Yellen's purview, um, but you, know, you and the Fed have gained a lot of expertise in this space. Uh, do you see the possibility at least of Putin or his oligarchs um, using digital payments and other alternative payment methodology to avoid these sanctions in a sense to Transfer, uh, transfer their assets out since we've been able to kind of clamp down within traditional banking realm. So you're, you're right. This is right in the heart of, uh, of what Secretary Yellen is working on. I believe she actually addressed this yesterday in, in some public remarks. Um, and I don't, I don't have, I don't, I'm not privy to any, um, you know, private information about, about this. You, you are reading about it. I, I saw that uh, transactions, crypto transactions are spiking in the Ukraine and in Russia. I, I just I think it really underscores the need to have a strong regulatory regime that permits appropriate activity, but that that prevents inappropriate activity. And we do have laws on the books and and, and all that. But I I, I think um, 
for digital finance generally, we, we need a legal framework that would that would really take take a take away as much as possible of the possibility uh, that people could use unbacked cryptocurrencies as as a way to evade the law or to finance terrorism and you know hide their hide their real gotten gains and things like that. I think it's very important. And and again, I appreciate the fact that the Fed has, I think, both expertise wise ramped up in this space. I do think. You know, the notion of a uh, United States having a digital currency when we see the challenges around the digital yuan from China. But I do think the amount of capital flows that are going into this area, uh, you know, non-banked in many ways, there is not that kind of clear regulatory overview. It's something we need to look about. And I, you know, I think as an independent source, we're going to need to continue to draw upon not only yours, but uh, the enormous resources you've got at the Fed to uh, at least follow the capital flows. And I am bravely concerned that uh, uh, Putin and his oligarchs may use this this escape valve uh, to escape these sanctions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Warren. Senator Scott from South Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chair Powell, for uh, investing the time with us. Uh, we have had We've seen you a lot lately, and I think it's important that we continue to have the conversation in public about the priorities of the Fed. One of the concerns that I have, I think both Senator Toomey and Senator Crapel have discussed the importance of the Fed staying on mission, not looking for ways to expand the mission, looking at nominees like Ms. Raskin's approach in public statements as it relates to the environmental responsibilities that the Fed should take on. I am completely unequivocally opposed to that direction. I know that there's a lot of attention being paid these days to ESG. Uh, I think that is a bad direction for the Fed. I think the Fed should focus its attention on its primary responsibilities and, frankly, not even get involved in congressional matters. I know that T Senator Tester had some important questions to the wrong person about truckers. I think if we were going to have a long, serious debate about your opinion on what Congress should do to help truckers, we would start back in the Obama administration and look at the hours of service that curtailed the number of available truckers that we have and the amount of time that they could spend on the roads. So there's a lot of things that the Fed shouldn't do. The one thing that we want you to continue to do is to focus on the impact that our, our, our everyday folks like in Abbeville, South Carolina, or in Anderson, South Carolina, or feeling the pressure from the inflationary effects of this economy. And we, we can't tie that to Russia or, or conflict. We can just tie that to bad decisions by Democrats and the Biden administration when on day one you cut off the Keystone XL pipeline, which could have pumped 800,000 barrels a day. And we are dependent on Russian oil at 600,000 barrels a day. The inflationary impact that South Carolinians have felt since December of 2020 were Prices were $1.99, and now they're $3.40. I think about the seniors who are trapped in too much month and too little money. And I think to myself that too many folks on fixed incomes throughout this country, and specifically in South Carolina, are having to make decisions about rationing, rationing medicine, rationing food, rationing energy, whether it's in your car or at your home. These are this is a crisis. Uh, I, I love to hear that our wages are up 4 or 5%, but inflation's up 7.5%. So the net effect is that the invisible tax that we refer to here in Washington as inflation is, is eroding and degrading the spending power of everyday Americans, and they are not gullible. They know exactly what has changed. And any time you put fuel on a fire, you should expect it to get hotter. And our economy reflects that same direction. And those are concerns that I have. And I know that yesterday you spoke at length about how the Fed policymakers are working to game out a variety of policy scenarios to grapple with the uncertain economic risks posed by the ongoing geopolitical turmoil while simultaneously working to curb still rising prices. And I think that is an important and incredible balance that you will be in charge of. And I'm frankly, didn't vote for you the first time, I'm voting for you this time, because I think that you've proven that you have kept your eye on the ball and it's necessary for folks in my state and around this country. I would love for you to spend my 90 seconds left. Talk, talk to me about the gaming out of scenarios that the Fed is going through so that the average person in our country can appreciate the depth that you are 
uh, the depth of knowledge and the time that you're investing in helping us understand the scenarios that could happen? Sure. So um, we, um, we have tools to bring inflation down, and, and they work by raising interest rates. We do that over time, and what that does is it, it increases mortgage rates, but just at the margin, and the same thing with the uh, car loans and things like that. And ultimately, that slows down demand, ideally, in a way that comes to a, a gradual halt, and economic activity continues. So that, that's what we're trying to do here. Um, right now, we need to move away from very low interest rates. They're not appropriate for the current situation in the economy. The economy is very strong. Unemployment is low. Wages are going up. Um, the labor market is, is quite healthy. And inflation is all too high. So we, we're responsible. We're accountable for, for inflation. And we're going to use our tools to, to bring it down. May I have a little more time, Chairman? I know this is your committee. Thank, thank you, sir. Uh, very kind. Uh, so, question for you. As you think about the next meeting when you discuss the interest rate increases, uh, are there increments that you would consider, not foreshadow, foreshadowing your decisions, but the incre incremental increases that you think would bring it, the spending and the, the inflation down while not over-challenging the economy? Yeah, so as I mentioned yesterday, my thinking at this time, which is a very, very sensitive time in markets and in, in the world because of what we're seeing happening in Ukraine, and we don't know the economic implications of that, I said that I would be recommending and supporting a, a, a one quarter of 1% interest rate increase at our March meeting, which is two weeks from uh, yesterday. Good. So, But I, but I, I also said that if... Um, if we don't see inflation behaving as we expect it to behave, which is to peak and begin to come down, if we see inflation behaving in ways not consistent with that, then we're prepared to raise by more than that amount in a, in a meeting or meetings. Very good. I, I would simply say for, as I call them, the uh, kitchen table economists all across the country, typically moms making hard decisions on rationing the amount of resources that they have and the priorities that they have, I think it's really important for us to make us clear as possible and as simple as possible, their understanding and appreciation for what's happening. When you're trying to run a very strong and uh, heavy load at, at home and you have a full-time job, I think what we can do to talk in a way that makes it easy for us to digest at home, we are doing our uh, public, the average person in our country, a lot of good to ex understand what we're trying to explain. Thank you. Senator Warren from Massachusetts is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right now, our country is trying to enforce strong sanctions against Russia, weather the political economic fallout of the Ukraine crisis, and address the pandemic-related inflation and corporate price gouging that's hurting American families. Much is at stake for our country. But Republicans on this committee refused to show up and vote on five nominees to the Fed. They refused to do their job. This is shameful and it is risky. Any Republican talking today about the risks facing our economy should be willing to show up and vote on Fed nominees. So let's talk about one of those risks, Mr. Chairman. As Russia has invaded Ukraine, the centerpiece of the U.S. response is economic sanctions. The U.S. and its allies have rolled out some of the strongest economic sanctions in history, severely restricting Russia's access to the global financial system by sanctioning the biggest banks and companies, by kicking Russian banks out of SWIFT, the international payments messaging system, and by freezing the Russian central bank's foreign reserves. Now, these sanctions are powerful, but Russia can dodge some of this pain by using the same cryptocurrency tools that are currently used by drug traffickers, cyber criminals, and tax cheats. I'll pick one example here. We've all become familiar with ransomware, where a cyber criminal infects someone's computer system, locks it up, then demands payment in order to unlock the system. And how do they get paid? Through unregulated cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. Chair Powell, you know who, do you know who cybersecurity experts say is the world leader in ransomware attacks and in getting paid through cryptocurrencies that allow them to obscure and hide their trails? I could guess, but I, I, I you think wanna, you, you know. want to make a guess here based on what we're talking about today? It's Russia. 
You know, if you listen to our own national security agencies, the answer is Russia. And that's why when President Biden held an international summit last year to fight ransomware, Russia, the biggest source of the problem, was intentionally not invited. According to one estimate by the blockchain analysis company, Chain Analysis, uh, Russia-linked actors collected nearly three-quarters of all ransomware revenue in the world last year. And hundreds of millions of crypto dollars are collected in Moscow each quarter. As much as half of those come from illicit crypto wallet addresses. Russia is the world's expert on moving money outside legal channels. So, Chair Powell, obviously, you do not administer sanctions, but you are an expert on the international financial system. So, I just want to take a look at this. Are other countries currently using cryptocurrencies to evade sanctions? I'm thinking here of North Korea, Iran, Venezuela. I honestly, it's not something we're responsible for. I, I mean, I, I have read it. I've read publicly that those things have happened, though. Yes. Well, the Treasury Department, the Department of Justice, the United Nations, and the IMF all say that the answer is yes. Crypto takes the sting out of sanctions. And in fact, the Treasury Department warned last year that crypto could undermine our sanctions regime. Theoretically, the crypto industry is supposed to enforce sanctions as well. So let me ask, Chair Powell, in the, is the crypto industry enforcing sanctions right now? So I've, what I've read, again, we don't, this is really for the Treasury Department, but I've, I've read the same things you have and that you had in your letter, which is uh, the, uh, some reluctance expressed on the part of cri the crypto industry to do that. All right. They are supposed to, but the problem is they haven't been doing a very good job. Just read the Treasury Department's sanctions review or the UN reports on sanctions compliance. We know that many crypto exchanges and wallets are not collecting information about the identities of their customers, are not screening their platforms for illicit activity, and are not reporting sanctions violations. Heck, this is how North Korea has been able to move money around and finance its illegal missile programs. Here's the thing. The whole point of crypto is that it allows someone to conduct financial transactions without having to go through the traditional banking system or traditional financial intermediaries. Right now, millions of transactions are taking place that are completely unregulated with no one verifying who gets what. And that means that while sanctions can make it very difficult for Russian companies, uh, political leaders, and billionaires to move money around in the traditional financial system, there is another shadow, unregulated world that they can turn to. Crypto poses a variety of threats uh, to financial stability, to investor protection, to our environment. But crypto is also providing a new way for countries to sanction-proof themselves. Cracking down on crypto is a critical piece of holding Russia accountable for its aggression. We can't fool around any longer. We need to get new crypto rules in place. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Moran from Kansas is recognized. Chairman, thank you. Uh, Chairman, thank you. Um, at least one member of the Open Market Committee has said that combining a relatively steep path of rate increases with a relatively modest reduction in the balance sheet could flatten the yield curve and, and distort incentives for private sector intermediation, especially for community banks. I, I Help me understand the relationship between balance sheet decisions and rate increase decisions and what thought process you would undertake in that regard. So we, we've, we've basically, we think of the interest rate as the active tool of monetary policy. And we think of uh, the balance sheet is something we do really in urgent situations. We, we buy assets, and, uh, and, and that tends to drive down long-term rates. So what we're, what we're you know, very much about to do, um, and, and we're going to do this over the course of this year, is both raise interest rates, and we're going to begin to allow the balance sheet to shrink and run off. As the balance sheet shrinks, it really depends on what, you know, the securities are maturing is what's happening, and uh, Treasury 
on the other side of the wall, Treasury's deciding what to issue. So they issue long, short, in the middle, that's what they do. So, but basically, um, and that will, that will have an effect on the yield curve and on financial conditions, but those are decisions that Treasury makes. But w the way we do it, though, to answer your question, is we, we, want, we want to decide a path for the balance sheet, and then we want to, we want to uh, let it go in the background and, and have the interest rate tool meeting to meeting be the, be the active policy tool. I, ho I hope that's responsive. And what's the, what's the different consequence between altering the balance sheet and altering interest rates? For what the shape happened, of the yield curve? Yeah, you mean? What happens differently in the economy as a result of doing one or the other? Or is there a reason to, to what's the reason to do them together? Well, we use the tools when we're using them actively, cutting interest rates and buying assets, uh, buying longer term assets. We're, we're trying to provide support for the economy. The interest rates affect shorter term rates. They actually more than they affect longer term rates. Uh, quantitative easing affects longer term rates, and those are important in the economy. When you turn it around, um, uh, really, as I, I tried to explain, um, we we shrink the size of the balance sheet. But really, if so, for example, if Treasury were to issue only long bonds, well, that would drive up rates, and that would tend to tilt the yield curve up. But that's a question for Treasury, the issuance question. And I'm trying to understand why you're trying to explain, and the fault probably lies with me, but is there a, in, in regard to interest rates, long-term, short-term, does it matter what should those tools you use? And is there a consequence different to an, an American industry, uh, a sector of our economy as a result of the, of, of the machinations between those two tools? N not really, not really. Um, so, uh, Again, you're with, with, with our interest rate is an overnight interest rate, right? And so when we change it, that it will affect asset prices all the way out the curve. It'll affect equity prices and things like that. But ultimately, if you're at the zero lower bound and you can't cut anymore, then you, then then you're in, you, in one sense you could be out of tools. And so actually, Milton Friedman was the one of the first to talk about this many years ago with respect to Japan. You can always affect longer term interest rates by buying you know, uh, uh, sovereign debt in the, and so that tends to bring down longer term rates. They all matter for the economy to the extent you borrow long. If you bar, if you're someone who likes to borrow very long, like, you know, investment grade companies, then your rates will go down for, you know, for 30 year lending. Most people, uh, the short end is more important. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm not going to ask you about uh, energy policy, but uh, let me uh, ask uh, what percentage uh, or what's the quantification of how uh, inflation is related to energy prices? So energy inflation is, um, when, we, when we talk about core inflation, uh, you know, we, we exclude inflation from energy and food prices because those are quite volatile. So right now, I guess, the, if you look at the way we look at it, core PCE is about is about uh, five in the range of five, and energy inflation and food inflation. You put it on top of that is is in the high sixes. So it's it's a it's close to a couple of percent, I believe. Um, and just in my last fourteen seconds, a highlight. Uh, I'm, I always worry about farmers and ranchers, uh, small towns, community banks, lenders to those farmers and ranchers, interest rates. And energy prices combined have a huge consequence to those who feed and clothe and provide energy to us and the world. And decisions that you make have perhaps a, an exacerbated consequence to somebody who borrows significant amounts of money to put seed in the ground at a time in which fertilizer costs, uh, diesel fuel uh, is uh, extremely high. Every input farmer faces today is here while commodity prices have risen, they've not risen sufficiently to overcome the cost of production. So we're very much aware of that. This, some of this shock is going to be very tough for agricultural companies, and that, that's um, something we'll be monitoring. We don't have the tools to, to, to deal with that very well, but that, that's clearly a risk. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you. Senator Smith from Minnesota is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Thank you so much, Chair Powell. It's wonderful to see you again. And I really appreciate the questions that uh, Senator Moran is asking about kind of how this actually works, the mechanics of the economics of this, because um, the impacts of interest rates 
um, as a, you know, the interest rates are the tool that the Fed has to address inflation, but in a world where the causes of inflation are so complex, it is, it can be a, um, it can have a tool with other impacts that you don't necessarily, you know, anticipate, or you can anticipate it, but you can't control for that. So um, I'm going to get, I want to come back to that because I'm very much thinking about this in the context of workforce and what we need to do about workforce. You know, you laid out in the beginning of your testimony that um, the American economy is really strong. We've seen, you know, millions and millions of Americans go back to work, fastest economic uh, growth since 1984. Unemployment rate is very low. And the economy is in good shape, notwithstanding the fact that we've got real challenges um, um, around um, rising prices for um, American families. In Minnesota, the biggest economic challenge that I hear people talk about is the workforce challenge, that there just are not enough people to do the work uh, that, we, um, that we have. Um, it's interesting, the US Chamber noted that women are participating in the labor force at the lowest rate since the 1970s. Um, and this is having significant impacts on our ability. Um, I can't vouch for the US Chamber's numbers, but it reflects what I have heard, which is that there is a very big discrepancy between the number of men that have come back to the workforce and the number of women, the number of women that have come back. So why is this happening? It's complicated, of course. There's a lot of early retirements, but there's a real issue with childcare and women being able to, uh, women and men, but women in particular, being able to um, come back to the um, workforce. And so, um, Chair Powell, can you sort of help me understand this? So if we were to invest um, as a country, if we were to invest in making childcare more affordable, more um, you know, accessible, what impact would that have on the overall economic conditions of this country and this, I mean, this workforce challenge that we have. And I'm, I want to try to understand the interplay between that and inflation and how this all comes together. You know, it would, it would of course depend on the design of the program and how well, how well executed it was and that kind of thing. But there is research. So labor economists have, including uh, one of our own reserve bank presidents, <clears throat> have, have written and done research on this and looked at other, other countries, try to control for other factors, but look to see whether uh, child care that can be afforded or is free uh, contributes to labor force participation among women and has have come back with positive results on that. So, and you know, that does make sense. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it's intuitive, I think, but, but that's what the research tends to show. Right. And so public investment, if we decided, which I think we should, but if we were to decide to make a public investment in, um, in making childcare more affordable, that wouldn't be an, that wouldn't contribute to inflation, would it? You know, um, you know. I mean, I think if you, if to the extent it got people back in the workforce and got them working, it would help over time. It would help relieve the labor shortage and things like that. So mm -hmm. there right. would be positive. That's effects. the way it seems to me too. That if one of the contributors, if if you have more people working, you're going to be addressing the workforce challenges and. Um, of course, I think it's a good thing that wages are going up, and I think that that's part of what's happening in the economy is the relative power of employers versus workers is shifted so that workers have more power and they're shifting jobs if they can get better salaries, get better wages in other places, and you know that might be contributing to rising wages, but um, it's generally, I think, a good thing. Um, how, what, what is the impact? If, so if the Fed, assuming the Fed does what it's planning on doing and raising interest rates, what impact does that have on the workforce shortage, if, if any? I mean, like, what's that interplay look like? Well, uh, we, we can't, again, we're, we're, our tools don't really go very much to supply. They go to demand. So right, right now we have um, substantial excess demand, as I mentioned. And, and I, right. I think the, the first 15 pages of our report are actually a really good summary of the labor market inflation and supply chains. I would, I would do that commercial. Um, but uh, you have more than 1.7 job openings per unemployed person, and that's just a, that's an overheated labor market. And you know the the, the level of quits is at its all time high. The level of job openings. So w there seems to me there's a lot that we could do to 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 gradually bring demand back down to where demand and supply are are more uh, you know in sync, and you know without without you know risking damage to uh, of the kind you're you're talking about so raising interest rates would cause companies to cut back they're not going to have as many job openings 
Yes, I mean, it, it slows economic activity across the economy gradually because uh, higher borrowing costs, people, uh, you know, uh, mortgage rates will go up, uh, the rates for car loans, all of those rates that affect consumers' buying decisions, and, and they, with a lag, they, it will tend to slow down uh, Job creation. In, in addition, you know, it has effects through, you know, through through wealth effects because housing prices won't go up as much and equity prices won't go up as much. And so people will spend less. And, it, and what we hope to achieve is bringing the economy to a level where demand and supply are, are in sync. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mr. Chair, I know that yeah, I was just I'm just thinking about what President Biden said on uh, at the State of the Union, which is that as we grapple with this problem, what we want to do is raise, we want to lower costs, not lower wages. And so I think this is just part of the dynamic that we're all trying to figure out here. Um, thank you so much for being with thank us, you. Chair Pennell. Thanks, Senator Smith. Senator Daines of Montana is recognized. Chairman, thank you. Chairman Powell, good to have you back here. Um, everybody's talking about inflation as we're sitting here today. It's raging in my home state of Montana. Uh, the 40 year high of 7.5% in January. Core inflation rose six percent, and uh, we recognize it's both above estimates and both well above the Federal Reserve's two percent target. As we take a look at what's going on in Europe and Russia, as it relates to energy prices, energy independence, national security, we're seeing it's all interconnected. As many countries in Europe continue to decommission nuclear power plants and stop investing in traditional energy, they've become now more dependent on adversaries like Russia for energy, and now we're seeing the cost of energy is skyrocketing. Sadly, I think this is a sneak peek at the path that America is headed down if President Biden and, frankly, our colleagues across the aisle continue to undermine made in America energy. In order to help lower energy costs, help our allies be less reliant on Putin and Russia, I believe we must unleash American energy and support truly the all the above American energy portfolio, which includes oil, natural gas, nuclear, hydro, and coal. I think it's more important now than ever before. Chairman Powell, the Fed demonstrated an unprecedented amount of speed to cut rates in March of 2020 when it first cut rates then by 50 basis points and followed that soon after by cutting rates to zero and launching a new round of uh, quantitative easing. My question is this, has the Fed looked at what impact $125 a barrel oil might have on growth and inflation? Because I think we were just here you know, about a year ago having conversations about inflation. Of course, we've moved away from any conversations about anything being transitory now, as we, we certainly have some inflation here that's far more than transitory. But I think it would be fair to say none of us at that moment would have thought we'd be seeing bar oil at $100 a barrel or more. My question is, have you looked at what $125 a barrel looks like, $150 a barrel, even $175 a barrel, what that might mean in terms of growth and inflation? The answer is yes. Uh, we do. We run simulations, and we're <clears throat> you know we're running those all the time right now. Uh, in addition, that we have these rules of thumb that that show what happens to gas prices, what happens to what happens to inflation, what happens to growth. They're they're crude rules of thumb, but they give us a way of thinking about what the effects would be, and they're what you would think. You know, inflation goes up, gas prices go up, and growth goes down a little bit. So, what uh, is you done that modeling? Um, what kind of impact are you going to see on in inflation in your models if it, we got, let's say, $125 or $150 a barrel? Well, you know, it's, it would be compared to if you go back, let, let's, say, let's say that that's $50 above where oil was um, it, during the fourth quarter last year. I want to say it was um, in the $75, $80 oh, range, something like that. So, you know, for every $10, and it, this could, the, the thing that matters more than anything is how long is it? Does it persist for? Mm -hmm. You can have an oil spike, mm -hmm. and if it just comes and goes, it won't. It'll prices will go up, but it won't actually affect ongoing inflation. That's really the key thing. Um, but you know, I think it's. I want to say ten dollars uh, of oil, and I hope I don't get this wrong. Is is like two tenths, something like that, of right. inflation. Of inflation. Yeah. How yeah. about on economic growth? What's your sense? It's more like one tenth. Okay. Um, 
these are rules of thumb. Yeah, and, and I think these numbers I've quoted here uh, aren't, aren't outlandish. I mean, you've seen how quickly this is moving, how volatile the situation is, and, and, um, and it's, uh, I'm, I'm glad you're modeling it, but uh, we're very, very concerned, certainly, as you are, where this might go. Um, I want to talk about the balance sheet, the Fed. Uh, the Federal Reserve's balance sheet's nearing $9 trillion, which is more than double where it was before the pandemic. Could you describe how unwinding the balance sheet as a tool to fight inflation compares to raising interest rates? For example, would a $500 billion reduction in the size of the balance sheet equate to a 50 basis point hike in interest rates? Uh, It would be a very crude calculation because we do think the signaling value of QE is a big part of it. And you you don't have that when you're when you're when you're having the balance sheet run up, but I'll, I, I don't want to, I don't have that one in my head. You're right though. There is, it, it is, that's, that's the sign is that it would be, it would be tightening policy. We, we really think of, of, of um, getting the balance sheet on, uh, you know, running in the background and shrinking in a predictable way. And we think about the, the interest rates as the active tool. Last question. Do you think we could be on the cusp <clears throat> of a wage price spiral and what factors are you using to make the determination? So this is um, obviously that's that's something we really don't want. It's it's part of what part of what we the big thing we don't want is to have inflation become entrenched and self self perpetuating, and it's it's a question of inflation psychology really and having what we call unanchored inflation expectations, and um, that's why we're moving ahead with our program to raise interest rates and get inflation under control. That that that's that is a serious concern, and one that we monitor carefully. Um, and uh, again, it will depend on uh, on on how wage increases have been very high, <clears throat> particularly at the low end. It will de- depend on whether those are persistent or not. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Dane. Senator Van Hollen of Maryland is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I was listening to your testimony, and as you pointed out, that uh, you've got a lot of job openings, a lot of vacancies, uh, and you pointed out. Uh, that there were some common sense measures we could take uh, to address those, including uh, more affordable childcare, so more people uh, could ensure that their kids are in a safe and secure and affordable place uh, while they're at work, Uh, and uh, in response to Senator Menendez, um, allowing people to come out of the shadows in our economy with some immigration uh, reform. And I think uh, those are both common sense measures, uh, as you said, that we should take. Um, you're, you're in a tough position given all the variables we're seeing, right? We're seeing higher economic growth. In fact, you've testified previously that, uh, you know, because of the American Rescue Plan, uh, we have uh, seen much more robust economic and job growth uh, than had been estimated before then. Uh, you've got a war in Ukraine, uh, which is uh, putting upward pressure on oil and gas uh, prices, uh, and that, in effect, that could also Uh, have an impact in slowing down the economy. I was interested in Senator Toomey's line of questioning. I mean, you've got to navigate that. Another variable here, of course, is the possibility of another variant of the coronavirus coming back and and wreaking havoc. Isn't that another uh, major unknown that you've got to factor into your decision making? Yes. Yes, it is. And as you think of that along the common sense lines, uh, doesn't it make sense that we be fully prepared so that there's another variant, an outbreak, uh, that we're able to quickly address it, uh, quickly uh, reduce the economic uh, fallout uh, that we witnessed uh, around the original outbreak. Doesn't that also make common sense? It sounds like it. I'm not, I'm not sure where I'm going here with it. it sounds like a fiscal proposal, but uh, well, it's it's like the other ones that are kind of common sense. I'm not asking yeah. you to make a, a a judgment totally within you know monetary policy or the Fed's domain in that sense, but from an economic perspective, and you have an important role to play <clears throat> there. Um, it seems to me that the more prepared we are to fight a new variant, the better off we will be from an economic perspective, right? Yes. I just point that out because we just received a request from the president uh, for a, a, a supplemental uh, assistance package uh, to stockpile uh, more antivirals so people could be treated more quickly, uh, to stockpile tests uh, so that we could quickly determine where we may experience an outbreak, um, and to stockpile more 
uh, vaccines and also to work globally uh, to prevent uh, a new variant from developing. Uh, again, just from an economic perspective, those preparations would make common sense, would they not? They would. And, you know, variant to variant, the economy has gotten better at dealing with this. The American people have. So I think anything that allows us to continue living our economic lives is a plus. I, I, I appreciate that. I think that we just need to take some practical steps, um, as you said. Um, can you just talk a little bit about um, the assessment that you made regarding uh, the uh, households being in strong financial shape? Uh, you, you mentioned that, and I, I think it's worth uh, just uh, elaborating on that a little bit, because uh, we have wage income, but we also have the income people received uh, as a result of the American Rescue Plan, right? $1,400 per person um, and other uh, emergency assistance we provided. And that has put households overall in strong financial shape. I think those are the words you used. Is that right? Yes. It, it, just as you say, uh, the, the level of savings among, even among those at the lower end of the income spectrum is is uh, much higher than, than trend uh, than it was just continuing the prior trend. So uh, relatively good, the surveys that we undertake, people feel better about their financial situation than they have uh, in, in a long time. Right, and, and again, we've had this back and forth about real wage growth, and I think if you, you look at people at the lower end of the economic spectrum, you've seen real wage growth, uh, as you uh, indicated. But if you look even overall at all households uh, in terms of their personal income last year, after tax personal income compared to this year, overall that's improved, right? Yes, nom in nominal terms. I'm, no, I'm asking in, in real terms, actually. Could you personal get back income. to us? So there, there are a lot of, you know, it depends on whether you're looking at one year or two year and, and which measure you're looking at. But um, uh, I, if you're, t you're talking about a particular piece of data, I don't have at hand. But I know that you know, for many, uh, wage, real wages rose in 2020 and, and in the aggregate declined marginally in 2021. Yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm talking about all, all the income available to a household all in income. real terms. I'm, I'm happy to follow up uh, in That'd real terms. That'd be great, terms, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Thank you. I think, uh, Senator Van Hollen, you're in part referring to the child tax credit and assistance that low income people had, if I recall. Child tax credit, $1,400 uh, per individual. Uh, all those helped in terms of personal household savings in real time, in, in real terms. Uh, Which is so. what matters in the quality of life. Uh, Senator Kennedy is recognized from uh, Louisiana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, the president has requested uh, that the Congress appropriate additional money to fight COVID. Senator Van Hollen just referred to it. Do we have that money? I uh, feel like I'm getting into fiscal policy here. I, I really want to leave this to uh, to. Yes, sir, but do we have that money? Do we have that money? Well, in the sense of uh, a do positive Do we even have 5% of that money? I don't know what you mean by have the money. Uh, you Will know, we, we have we, to borrow the money? I think, yeah, I think we're running deficits, so I think a lot of spending is, is, is on the basis of borrowing. Right. Okay. Let me ask you about, uh, about the sanctions on Russia's central bank. Uh, the West has sanctions its bank, it's, and, and uh, you say it has, or some say that it has basically prevented from Russia from using those foreign reserves because they're foreign reserves. They're not in Russia. They're in other banks and other countries. <coughs> Has China joined in that sanction? Uh, no, I don't believe so. So if China wants to, it could support the, the ruble, could it not? In theory, yes. Now, does that sanction on, those, on the uh, foreign reserves of Russia by the West, does that stop dollars and euros from coming into Russia? I think other sanctions do. We're, we're, they're not getting any hard currency. And um, uh, I think a lot of, the, of, that, of payment in dollars into Russia is, is coming to a, a grinding halt. Mm -hmm. By the way, I should say we, 
we're really uh, not the not responsible for sanctions, as you obviously that. know. You're so. not responsible for climate change either, but <laughs> that doesn't stop the Federal Reserve or for elementary and secondary education. But that hasn't stopped the Federal Reserve from having an opinion. Not you, but some of your colleagues. Now, the West has said, the president has said, we're going to throw Russia out of the international community, and we're going to throw Russia out of the international marketplace. And obviously, we all agree with that. And he sanctioned everything. But he hasn't sanctioned Russia's energy. Europe is going to continue to buy Russia oil and gas, despite the fact that Europe has 1,000 trillion cubic feet of natural gas that it refuses to produce. And America, right now, we're continuing to buy Russian oil. So how are we going, how, how are we going to throw Russia out of the international community and global markets if we don't attack their oil? And that, that really is a question for the elected government, by the administration, and particularly the Treasury Department. I know, but I'm asking your opinion, because you're a smart man. I appreciate that very much, but my, my opinion is that it's not something I would have an opinion on uh, as, as Fed chair. It's just we don't do energy policy. We don't do sanctions. We're, we're technical support. We're not the policymaker. So I would, I would be, it would be like the, the, the Secretary of the Treasury coming in and talking about monetary policy. Okay, let me take you back to... Uh, the spring of 2020, um, governments shut down the private sector in virtually every country. Uh, markets are panicking. Um, everybody's looking at you to calm things down. You did. You did. And one of the things you did aside from the currency swap line that you established, well played. Um, you said we have to, we're going to, we meaning the Federal Reserve, are going to provide capital to American businesses. Okay? And you did. And you kept us going. And I thank you for that. Suppose, though, the Federal Reserve had said at that time, we're going to keep American businesses going and we're going to supply the capital, except we're going to use this opportunity to bankrupt the oil and gas community, the oil and gas sector. What do you, where would we be today if we'd done that? You'd be very unhappy with me, and appropriately so. Um, Why is that? Well, because... Because some, some of your possible new colleagues think we should have done that. Because yeah, Raskin has talked about that. Said we should have taken the opportunity to, to at that point to bankrupt oil and gas. So I, I don't want to I, I don't want to get into the, the I, I just thought I'd slip that in. <laughs> I'm not asking you to comment on Ms. Raskin. Our reserve trust are the other things that we need to get to the bottom of. I'm asking you to tell me what would have happened if we used that opportunity to bankrupt the fossil fuel industry, as Ms. Raskin suggested we should. Well, strike the Raskin part. That makes you nervous. I can tell. No, I, I just, you know, we're we're a creature of law. You passed the CARES Act. It didn't say anything about picking and choosing, and we weren't going to do that. We didn't do it. You think picking and choosing is a bad idea? I, I think, uh, you know, we actually have a. A document I have right here from 2009 where we, it's sort of our document where we negotiated with the Treasury Department who does what, and it, it talks about our, the fact that we don't get into allocating credit. We try to affect broad credit conditions. We don't allocate credit to particular industries. And that's, that's a document that we think is sort of one we live with. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. Thank you, Senator Kennedy. Senator uh, Assaw from George is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair Powell, thank you for joining us again. Thank you, as always, for your service. Good. Please explain to the committee and to the American public what steps the Fed is taking and expects to take in response to the increase in price level for consumer goods, gas, and groceries. Well, we are, uh, 
as I discussed uh, yesterday, we are embarking on a series of rate increases over the course of this year and no doubt beyond. And um, we're also going to be shrinking the size of our balance sheet um, uh, as the year goes on. So what those things will do is they will raise interest rates across the economy, and that has uh, the effect of, of moving demand back down to where it's more aligned with supply and, and getting inflation back down to a level that we would recognize and, and is, that isn't consistent with our mandate of around 2%. And uh, what considerations will inform you and your team as you determine the rate at which you reduce the value of assets on the Fed's balance sheet? Um, so the way we think about that is we want to set a, uh, you know, and this is the meeting we're going to have in two weeks. Um, we're going to set a pace at which runoff will happen subject to caps so that if there's more runoff, we, basically when securities mature, we can we can just not reinvest that money. We can just give that money back to the Treasury Department. And that's what we do up to a certain limit. We like to have caps so that, so that, it doesn't, um, uh, so that it's not volatile and, and it doesn't affect markets. With, with, uh, so essentially, it's what we think uh, we can do in ways that won't interfere with market function uh, and that will get us back expeditiously to a balance sheet, which is what we, the one we need, which is uh, just the right size to implement monetary policy consisting of demand for our liabilities plus a buffer. Ample reserves, we call it. We're, we're seeing right now the uh, impact of geopolitical events on markets, uh, a likely impact on um, the price level, potentially on unemployment, uh, and therefore on your mandate. I'd um, like to request that you consider providing this committee with a members-only briefing that would cover uh, two subjects. Uh, the first is how the Federal Intelligence Coordination Office uh, that connects you and your team with the intelligence community performs in ensuring that you and your team are up to date on the latest intelligence that could provide a forewarning of geopolitical events uh, that impact your mandate and financial markets and the U.S. economy. And the second uh, is a briefing on the resilience of uh, your internal systems and, and uh, the, the mechanisms of action for monetary policy in the event of a cyber attack or a continuity of government event such that you can continue to do your job even if the nation's information technology or financial infrastructure is degraded or under attack. Will you uh, and your team provide to this committee in a members only or closed or classified setting as necessary that information? Sure. Uh, the second one for sure. I'm, I'm not sure there's a lot to really well, we can talk about this offline in terms of what there is to talk about, but we're, we're delighted to come up if you want to have us up for a briefing. If the chair and the ranking member want us to come up, we'll come up anytime. Okay, we will uh, coordinate that with committee leadership and look forward to making that happen. How do you consider the labor participation rate when you think about what it means to fulfill your mandate with respect to employment? Um, so... It's one of the key measures. There are many, many measures that go into determining what is maximum employment. Ultimately, maximum employment uh, is one way to think about it, the highest level that's consistent with price stability. And so um, at a certain point, labor supply, labor supply has not increased and uh, at the pace that everyone expected it to increase at. It's still below, uh, uh, meaningfully below where, where it ought to be, even based on its uh, trend. Very hard to understand why that is. There's a great discussion of it in the monetary policy report. So we have to essentially what we do is we make a forecast, and that forecast now amounts to relatively modest additional improvement in labor force participation. We factor that into how tight the labor market will be. That will give us a view on unemployment, on wages, and things like that. And so that that's how we do it. Um, and that's the reason it's fairly modest improvements is that's what we've seen so far. The chairman's a stickler for time, so I'm just going to get this last question in here. Will you please provide to my office uh, the research that the Fed has conducted or uh, third-party academic research that you consider credible with respect to the distributional effects of monetary policy of the last 15 years, the uh, quantitative easing programs, the massive increase in the money supply from central banks across the world, how that's impacted the Gini coefficient and other uh, distributional and inequality measures? Be delighted to. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Ossoff, Senator Haggerty from Tennessee is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ranking member, I appreciate your holding 
getting us together today again. And um, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your being here. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about what uh, Senator Kennedy was just talking about, what Senator Daines touched on with respect to energy. Um, as a candidate, uh, President Biden promised that he would do away with the oil and gas industry here in America if he were elected. And I think he's, that's been one of the campaign promises that he's been very effective at essentially undertaking a war on that industry, whether it's killing the Keystone XL pipeline permits, whether it is terminating oil and gas leases on federal lands, pressuring asset managers and banks uh, to stop lending, to divest from energy projects. Uh, it's been a very extensive effort to decrease American energy production. That's had the effect of costing American jobs. It's had an effect of raising domestic prices for energy. But it's also had an effect, as Senator Kennedy mentioned, of making it extremely difficult for the Biden administration to respond to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Because it makes it very difficult for President Biden to hit Vladimir Putin where it will really hurt. It makes it difficult to sanction Putin's energy. The reason for that is sanctioning Putin's energy, again, according to the, the argument that Senator Kennedy eloquently laid out, uh, is going to raise prices for energy around the world, given our dependence on Russian energy and others. Um, we're in a tough spot. And energy touches so many aspects of our economy. Uh, I hope I could get your insight in terms of how you look at the trend line for energy prices, Mr. Chairman, and how that's going to affect monetary policy moving forward. Well, I mean, in, in the near term, um, clearly energy prices have, have gone up and they may go up further. We, it, it depends upon events to come. Uh, and that's going to push up inflation. Um, certainly in the near term, gas prices will go up. We'll see, as I mentioned earlier, there, there'll be effects on inflation, on growth, on gas prices. And it all comes down to how persistent will they be. If, you know, the, the, if it's a spike that comes back down or that we, it looks like it's coming back down, then that's one thing. If, it, if, it, if it's persistent, then that's a different thing. And, and uh, we'll be much more concerned at the latter. And also, frankly, the effect that, that just another oil price shock would have on general uh, infl inflation expectations. We'll be watching that very carefully. I, I wake up every morning and check futures prices. I'm sure you've got many, many variables that you watch, and I would um, look forward to your insight in terms of what you think are the most informative variables uh, as you think about monetary policy in the long run. I, I'd like to turn uh, to the Fed's accountability right now. Uh, and again, this touches on inflation. Um, I think that the Federal Reserve is in a very difficult situation right now, Mr. Chairman. You and I have talked about it. A lot of the stimulus spending, fiscal policy have made your job very difficult. We've had that discussion in hearings before. But with January CPI print at 7.5%, it really does feel like the Fed's behind the curve right now and may have to take more aggressive actions than otherwise would have been the case. And I saw that the most recent monetary policy report omitted the section on monetary policy rules. And I know those rules aren't uh, intended to be prescriptive there, but they're to consult for contextualization. But it was concerning that they were missing. And again, I think those rules would have indicated that we're behind the, the curve, that there's more to be done on inflation. And it brought me to think about how does the Fed think about accountability? How do you think about holding the Fed accountable for managing inflation? So we'll, we'll bring them back for the July thing. Honestly, we, we sometimes do and sometimes don't. Um, and I, I would, by the way, I'd recommend look at the, Cle the Cleveland Fed has a uh, it really the all of the rules, and there's a range of rules, but um, clearly they, the, the median rule is, is um, you know, so. But in terms of accountability, you know, it's, it starts with transparency from us and, you know, explaining to you, you, you are the mechanism through which we get our, our transparency. We deliver transparency and we get our democratic accountability by explaining ourselves in understandable terms to you and by you holding us accountable. And it, it, in our system of government, it runs through this committee and, and the Senate and, and the House as well. And so we try to, we try to be very transparent. We try to, uh, to be engaged with, with members and explain and hear your concerns and all those kind of things. Ultimately, it's, you know, it's the bottom line. You know, we both came from the business world. Mm -hmm. It's what you deliver, and we need to deliver price stability. We're not currently doing that, and we're, we're very highly motivated to, to get, back, get the, the economy back to a place where we have inflation under control, but also a strong economy and a strong labor market. 
I, I couldn't agree with you more. A accountability and, 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 frankly, credibility are so important for the Fed. I know the ranking members talked a good deal about mission creep at the Fed, politicization of the Fed. Uh, I'll just underscore and associate myself with his remarks there as well in terms of my concern there, because it does get uh, very deep to um, the credibility of an organization that we're all so dependent upon to, to be credible, to be transparent, as you described, and to, to accurately telegraph where we're headed uh, as, a, um, as a nation and as, a, as the most significant economy in the world. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Thank Senator Haggerty. Uh, Senator Cortez Masto, who waited patiently in person, is now, um, for her turn, is now recognized from her office. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and thank you, uh, Chairman Powell, for being here. Um, let, let me, uh, I've listened intently until I had to run over to the Energy and Natural Resources Committee. But one question I have for you, and I, I appreciate your candor always. Um, clearly, uh, the focus is price stability, but we are having challenges right now. Based on what you know now with our economy and the facts before us, um, do you believe that um, the Fed should have engaged its monetary tools a year ago instead of waiting till March to engage some of those to address the price instability? I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear the last part of your question. I apologize that it wasn't. No, that's okay. Do you believe, and let me know if you can't hear me okay, do you believe that the Federal Reserve, based on what you know now with the facts in the economy, should have engaged uh, their tools to address the price instability a year ago instead of waiting until March? I, I don't know about a year ago. I, I would say this, you know, we, we, we thought that the supply side problems would, uh, would get better faster than this. They haven't. Uh, had had we known that they weren't going to get better, uh, then then certainly we would have uh, we would have engaged our tools earlier. Okay, let me um, l let me talk about the uh, the monetary policy report. You make a strong case that the USA economy is the best in the world. Um, do you believe that our economy has weathered the COVID nineteen pandemic more effectively than other nations? I think you, there's a, quite a lot of evidence to that effect. Yes. Thank you. And I appreciate your, your um, consistent focus on leisure and hospitality uh, industry. As you well know, I talk to you about it all the time, uh, coming from the state of Nevada. Can you speak to the Fed's uh, report that wages in the leisure and hospitality sector are improving quickly? Yes. I mean, that, that's an area where we've seen very large wage increases, uh, but still, uh, uh, you know, it's still one of those very much an in-person business, and I, I guess it's still difficult to hire people, which is, of course, why the wages have gone up so much. And is why do you think that nearly a third of all jobs added to the economy in January were in leisure and hospitality? I'm curious. I just think that's where the job openings are. You know, that's where yeah. that's still the part of the economy. I don't need to tell you that's that's the part of the economy that still has to fully recover. And thank you. That's what I wanted to hear, because it's true. I see the unemployment rate numbers in my state. The, the highest unemployment rates are in southern Nevada, where the hospitality and leisure industry is. And we cannot forget that. And that has been the challenge to our uh, workforce in general and getting people back to work. Uh, I know Senator Smith asked you this question, but I do. Let me just reiterate this uh, going back to a, a full workforce. Um, there are interesting facts in the monetary report, particularly on um, in the first 73 pages. Um, but there was nothing in the labor force um, discussion regarding about the importance of women in that labor force. Um, and, and so how I'm assuming you utilize uh, that factor as well. Does the Federal Reserve, Reserve analyze uh, women's workforce participation? Oh, yes, very much so. So it, there's a story there. Um, I don't know why it didn't go into this uh, if it's not in there. But I mean, what, early on, um, women bore the brunt of, uh, of participation in, and, and of job loss. And, um, but over the course of the pandemic, much of that effect has really reversed. So you're back now to, I, I, we were looking at this earlier this week, you're, you know, if you look at the, the change in participation or or unemployment for men and women, it's just, it's very hard to see any difference at this point. Uh, but that was not the case a year ago where women, you know, bore the brunt then, but not so much now. And do you think impact of uh, lack of childcare has impacted and been a barrier for women to get back in the workforce? Yes. And, and I think caregiving, if you look at, there's a, there's a table, I think on page 11 in our book that shows who's not participating. Actually, childcare is not so much caregiving overall 
is is a, is a big number, but it, the, the, according to this data, anyway, um, uh, childcare as such is not is no no, no longer big from a, from a macroeconomic standpoint. I know for the people affected, it's it's big. Thank you. And, and then one of the other areas that we've been talking about uh, the price the rising prices that we see and that I hear about at home, I see at home. Um, one area though is around housing. Uh, and the focus on how we can uh, reduce costs uh, and the prices for affordable housing. Um, I, I, and so uh, there is work being done that we have done already, but also that we can still address to increase the housing supply uh, here and incentivize that at the federal level. Um, I'm just curious, would you believe that investments increasing the supply of housing uh, effective in the inflation that we see in the housing market? and Inflation overall. So we're, if you're into, if you're getting into uh, fiscal policy to support affordable housing, that's uh, certainly a worthy and important uh, issue, but really not our, our doing. No, just um, the fact of the supply and demand. If, if what mean, we're seeing is more of a demand for housing, a lack of supply, and if we are to incentivize that um, increase in the supply of housing, that should lower costs. That should help address the inflationary. Right. I think if you create more supply, then then you'll get prices going down pretty much in anything. Yeah, I appreciate that. Chairman Powell, thank you again. Thank, thank you, you for all we for the committee. Thanks, Senator Cortez Meso. Senator Tillis from North Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair Powell, thank you for being here. And thank you again for your long track record of being very accessible uh, when we call you answer the phone. And I appreciate that. Um, you know, I wanted to talk briefly. Senator Smith talked about child care and in response. I'm paraphrasing. You said it depends on how it would be designed and executed. And, and then you just made a point in response to Senator Cortez Masto that not so much child care, but dependent chair, a care. It could be uh, a parent that you're taking care of. It could be a, a disabled spouse. It could be any number of other instances. You know, I think if we stop talking, well, let, let me back up and say, do you think that a universal child care flood the zone, even for non-working uh, persons, uh, would be helpful to uh, the fixing the problems that you have right now? Like everybody gets it, I, whether you're going to work or not. I don't really think that's really not for me to say. That's a, that's a real legislative question to me. But it's sort of a flooding. I know you can't answer it because there are, there are pending proposals there. But it just seems to me that if we wanted to really stop talking past each other and start talking about policies that make sense, that free people up who have marketable skills or who could go to school and get marketable skills and focus on that segment of the population, that's probably an area where we could get some consensus that would have a positive economic impact on productivity, potentially even revenue, more people working, more businesses prospered. So that's something I think our members should look at versus the uh, some of the positions we've had here where we haven't made any any progress, and I think we should. We filed a bill this week, Senator Chester and I have been working on, and I appreciate the chair's uh, uh, support for what we're trying to do for the library trans transition. Um, could you speak to the importance, with all the other things going on here, some members may not be dialed into it, and not necessarily think it's important. Could you could you speak to the importance of getting the library transition legislation passed, which I understand that you all are in support of in its final form? Yes, yeah, so it's so it's very important because there there will be some um, some remaining contracts that are that are not covered by fallback language, and this really is to plug that hole. Very important from a financial stability standpoint. It's good that we're down to this last so-called hard tail, but it, this this is important legislation. Thank you for that. I hope that we can get it uh, moved forward. Um, in, uh, in any research or reports that you're getting, uh, economic research or reports, uh, how well, and I know it would vary sector uh, to sector, but how well are small businesses doing right now? You know, startups or uh, startups of small businesses, I guess every startup is a small business, uh, are really high and have been right through the pandemic. Didn't see that coming, but it, that's that's been the case. I think... The, you know, I remember, you know, seeing that small businesses at the beginning of the pandemic didn't have the resources. We were very, very worried about losing a lot of small businesses through no fault of their own at the beginning of the pandemic. But that really didn't happen. So um, some of that likely is, paycheck protection, other stimulative measures probably had an impact on that. Some of them just figured out how to weather the storm. 
Yes, and I just think the overall economy for what Congress did and what we did, you know, I think the, the economy recovered so much quicker than we were afraid. In North Carolina, we're, we're approaching about $90 billion in agriculture uh, product every year. Uh, I talked with a farmers group yesterday that are struggling with access to labor and increased cost. Um, do you think the way that they fix their problems or, or businesses that are struggling with the cost of inputs up, inflate it, they can pass some of that to the consumer, not all of it, but d is it your general sense or intuition that most of these small businesses are flush with cash and margins? I mean, it depends on the sector, yeah. I would think. Some of them, but uh, it depends on, I think the, the agricultural businesses are paying big fertilizer costs and, and you know, we hear a lot of, uh, of stress in that sector. So would, would it just, I know you're not an economist, but intuitively, do you think just looking certain sectors in the eye and saying cut costs is, the, uh, is even a viable option given where we are with uh, inflationary pressures? I think businesses are always minimizing their costs. Mm -hmm. um, but if we're, I, I don't, if we're talking about the president's uh, speech. But I think there's a general consensus that any business that's not trying to cut costs so they can increase their margins or pay their employees more, then they're not competent business people. Could you at least agree with that? I, I absolutely agree with that. Yeah. So to suggest that they're not cutting costs right now would suggest that maybe they're not competent. I don't expect you to respond to that, but that's what I infer from the statements from the president. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, sir. Thank you, uh, Senator Hill. Senator Warnock from George is recognized. Thank you so very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, uh, Chair Powell, for being uh, here again today. Every day I hear from Georgians who are feeling the pinch of rising costs in their wallets. Wages grew last year, but this growth has not kept pace with rising costs for housing, for gas, for groceries. Georgia families are swimming upstream, and while supply chain disruptions contribute to the problem, they are not the sole cause. Three global shipping alliances control delivery from the majority of imported goods. Two companies account for 70% of America's diaper market. And just four meat processors control more than 80% of the beef industry. This type of market concentration lowers competition and gives giant companies more power to use inflation as an excuse to raise prices, leaving Georgia families to, fit, to foot the bill while their executives and, and investors get richer and richer. This is why I pushed for a federal investigation into apparent price gouging by international cargo carriers, um, carriers that have seen as much as 2,000% increase in profit in the midst of a pandemic. Chairman Powell, yes or no, do you agree that more market competition is generally good for the economy and for consumers? I do. Uh, and that too much market concentration poses a risk, a risk that consumers can feel and are feeling, in fact, right now with rising prices. Well, I, th I think um, that's an appropriate, yeah. concentration is an appropriate subject for the competition authorities. But does, does, but does comp, uh, market concentration pose a risk I for rising prices, yes or no? Yes, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be heard to say, though, that I think it's, that that's the real sort, the main source of inflation, but it certainly is. Uh, so uh, do, do you believe there is a role for the Federal Reserve to promote market competition to help ease inflationary pressures? So we don't, outside of the banking industry, we don't, um, we don't have a role in competition policy as such. We do administer statutes that, uh, that bear on that. But ultimately, though, our jobs are inflation and maximum employment, as you know very well. The, 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 the industries that you're talking about um, uh, and the kind of issues that you're talking about really are for the antitrust uh, people rather than for, for monetary policy. Right. But dealing with inflation is part of your, yes. your mission and your mandate. And if uh, market concentration is contributing to that, then that involve the Fed's mandate. But we, we don't have the tools to deal with market concentration. And it's, it's you know, we're, we're supposed to achieve maximum employment and price stability. Um, that would, that's the classic, uh, the classic role for the antitrust 
uh, uh, people in, at the FTC and the Justice Department and, and at the state level rather than for us. Will you commit to a study on how market concentration has affected the price of consumer goods during the pandemic and share that study with Congress and antitrust enforcers? So I, I, can, I, can, um, I think I can do better than that, which is we, we actually have a, a, a good amount of research from inside the Fed and from outside the Fed that, that bears on these questions, and we'll be happy to share that with you uh, right away. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, I look forward to working with you uh, to address the root causes of rising costs uh, for Georgia families, for American families in general. All right. Mr. Chairman, um, I've got 50 seconds left, but I'm going to defy Baptist preacher gravity. That's the end of my question. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Senator Warnock. Uh, Senator, uh, follow that advice, Senator Rounds from South Dakota. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, first of all, thanks for what you do. Appreciate it and appreciate your openness with us. I, I want to go back and kind of simplify a couple of things if we can a little bit, just in terms of the, the issues surrounding inflation. I think it's fair to say that there's, if you divide it, one way you could divide it is into two parts, one being the supply side, uh, a pressure on, on inflation, and the second side being the demand side. I think the last time that you were here before this committee, we talked about the fact that the Fed really had the ability to impact the demand side. Fair to say that that's where most of your capabilities are today? or Yes, you dis very much so. Yeah. In order to do that, and I know that the, the question is, is trying to get inflation down to 2% or so, what, what would you say is of the total amount, and right now we're running 7.5%, how much of that? can the Fed actually impact with their policies? What part of it is demand-driven versus supply-driven in the analysis that you do? That's, that's a really interesting question. I don't, I, don't have a, I don't have a precise answer for that. I think it's clearly both, and that's why I would say to get back to you know, 2% inflation, we really do think we're going to need help from the supply side uh, in the form of just uh, uh, the bottlenecks and, and shortages and, and all that being alleviated as well. When, when you make uh, determination as to the tools that are available to you, in particular, primarily raising in the, in the, in the basic interest rates that are, are available to you right now. How much of that inflation do you think you can impact using the tools that you've got right now? I, I, what, I, what I'm pointing is, is it seems to me that if, if we decided that the tools that you have are available to fix all of inflation, we put you in a really tough spot, and we may very well go way overboard on the amount of interest increases and not be able to actually impact a significant part of the inflation itself. A, a fair concern to have? Yes. Yeah, so, and, and I think we need to keep in, we need to bear in mind, and we will keep in mind, that some of this is because of very strong demand meeting a, 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 you know, limited supply, an inflexible supply. Mm -hmm. Cars is a great example. Ordinarily, if, if there's demand for cars, a lot of demand, the car makers go, this is great, we'll make more cars, and we'll raise the prices too. If you, you can't make more cars without more semiconductors, right? You can only make the amount that you're making. And so what happens is it all goes into higher prices. So, you know, we can, we can lower car demand by raising rates, and we'll do that. But ultimately, we need more semiconductors so that there can be more cars as well to really, it, to, to really get back to 2% inflation. Fuel costs got up in some cases 40% in the last year, though. You can't really impact no, we can't. that portion of it. No. Well, I mean, we, we can impact demand, but really these prices are set at the global level, but yeah. by and large, and so it's really not, really we can't affect it. The, uh, the section of the monetary policy report on our debt and deficit explains that due to the extreme federal spending, the federal deficit surged by 15% of nominal GDP in 2020, and Federal deficits are expected to increase by roughly $5.4 trillion by the end of fiscal year 2030. Federal debt by the public jumped to above 100% of nominal GDP in 2020, the highest debt to GDP ratio since 1947, and it remained there in 2021. If the Fed is slated to raise interest rates potentially more than five times this year, the interest on the federal debt will also rise, further ballooning the national debt. What effect? does a ballooning national debt have on the economy and how does the Fed factor that into, for, or into its forecasting uh, of, of that portion of the challenge? 
But it doesn't have uh, our our unsustainable fiscal path doesn't really have a bearing on the you know we work in business cycle limit you know, that that's sort of the time frame we can we can think about things given our tools and and what they do. Um, you know, we are on an unsustainable fiscal path, meaning that the debt is growing faster than the economy. That, by definition, is is unsustainable in the long run. We need to we need to get back to that. Uh, but the time to do that is when the economy is strong, and um, that's that's really all I can say. That's all all I can say about it. Okay, one last question. That's this week the Fed announced a proposed plan to improve the process for financial institutions looking to get access to Fed Master Account. Um, Seems unique that it would happen right now with everything else going on with regard to nominations here before us. Does it, would it suggest that the Fed believes that the process has been abused in the past or is this just an arbitrary determine, determination being made right now? What's the reason for this investigation? Well, it's, it's just we've, we've had um, the burgeoning. Um, it's really the, the, the digital finance and all the new kinds of charters and, and all of those things. And, and there's a need for for us to, and we took our, you know, we, we put a lot of time and, and thought into, you know, to the extent to which we should provide master accounts to fintechs that may or may not have deposit insurance. And it's, you know, it's highly precedential and we wanted to get it right. So this is just, a, we've been thinking about this for a long time, as your one of your colleagues knows well. And um, we're, this is a proposal. It's out for comment, I think, for 45 days. And it, it gives sort of three tiers and you know we want to get public feedback on that, but it's there. It's, I think it's taken us a while to get to, to get to this. There's no magic to the timing, but um, it's just a reflection of, of what's going on in the in the world of, of uh, you know digital finance. Very good, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank Senator around thank Senator you, Mr. Reed from Rhode Island's recognized. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chairman Powell, for your great work and. Senator Cortez Matzos raised the issue of housing, and for families all across the country, particularly my home state, Rhode Island, this is one of the biggest forms of inflation they're seeing. Um, <clears throat> it's been reported that uh, housing prices year over year have gone up 20%. Rent in uh, nationwide in January rose uh, 14% in 2021, the last numbers we have. But uh, I had school principals in yesterday, and they were commenting about some of their families have to leave a working class community in Rhode Island because they can't afford the housing, and this is in luxury housing, to go into poor neighborhoods just to have a, some shelter. And I'm afraid there's another factor that's going to really exacerbate what's going on, and that is private equity and Wall Street have decided that they're going to buy up as many homes as they can. Um, and that disrupts what we assume is the typical housing market uh, for, for both rental, i.e. Uh, relatively small owners have rental properties in the state. They, they have a relationship with their tenants. When it comes to homes, uh, you, you buy a starter house and then you, you move up and you sell it. And these are families who are realtors selling it. Now we've got the big machines that are just buying up houses, throwing people out. And I think that's something that's going to essentially sneak up on us, like the derivatives crisis and a lot of other crises in the past. But what you're going to do and we, in your authority is uh, address the demand side of the economy. This is really a supply side uh, issue, I would assume you'd agree. Yes. Uh, but if we do not address it, uh, we will see continued inflation in housing and continued problems, and that's contributing significantly to the overall inflation rate. Is that accurate? Well, I, I think in housing, you've got uh, it, it's land, labor, lots, materials, and, and it's very strong demand. All of those are scarce, and it's very strong demand hitting hitting that, and, and so that's why you're, that's why you're seeing prices. Uh, well, now, uh, w will the interest rate increases do you think affect demand for housing? I expect they will, yes. Uh, it's a very interest-sensitive sector. Yeah, and so that will, the uh, home ownership, in terms of rental housing, that typically, because of the supply shortage, will be passed on to the renter, I would assume. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, we have a, a, a problem that affects families all through this country on the fiscal side and do something that's appropriate. 
Uh, I'm, uh, we are witnessing an extraordinarily uh, disturbing uh, conflict in the Ukraine. And it's going to have repercussions in many different dimensions. I think it will also have rec repercussions in the financial world. And I hope the Fed is tuning in and watching closely. Uh, I think the Chinese are particularly interested in the fact that we've been able to assemble a global coalition to basically shut down the Russian economy. And they will start thinking about how they can uh, avoid that fate if they get into a similar circumstance. I, uh, they have, I think, a rudimentary SWIFT system, uh, which they might try promoting much more, uh, which could interfere with the, the system that we have invested. Then uh, cryptocurrency it will be exploited. Uh, I think also, too, that uh, you know, the whole issue of the dollar as the medium of exchange for the world, which, which is the, the key that is really uh, making our, our sanctions effective, uh, the, the Chinese, again, will look very closely as they have in the past. Uh, so first, I presume you're going to look at this issue very closely. And second, uh, inform us of what developments. And then third, you might just indicate what you think might happen. Yes, yes to all of the above. It's a, um, I mean, that you're asking some longer term questions right. about the reserve currency and that, you know, the Chinese um, messaging system that is, that is like SWIFT. Um, in the near term, uh, those are not going to have there's not going to be big questions in this one particular instance, but in the longer run, I think those things are, are very much uh, on the table. And, and so we will see at some point, and again, not in months, but probably years, uh, movement, particularly by the Chinese, to insulate themselves from the same thing that they, they're observing in Russia now. And, that, and that's going on now. I mean, that's been going on for some time. So this, but this may, it may change the trajectory. It's an accelerant. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Reid. Uh, Senator Sinema from Arizona is recognized from her office. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to Chair Powell for being here today to speak about these important issues. As you know, over the last two years, we've seen the significant impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on our global supply chains for both industrial and consumer goods. While our economy is beginning to recover, we are already seeing the impact that Vladimir Putin's illegal, violent attack on Ukraine will have on the price of oil and gas here at home. I'm supportive of the strong, swift actions the administration has taken to sanction major Russian banks and Russian oligarchs in response to the unprovoked war that Russia is waging against Ukraine. I can believe we can go farther and do more. I'm also mindful of the impact that these sanctions are having and will continue to have on everyday people, not just in Russia and Ukraine, but also here at home. These sanctions can affect the availability and pricing of essential goods for hardworking Arizona families by further disrupting global supply chains. Let me be clear, Arizonans stand with Ukraine in their fight to determine their destiny. We are supportive of the actions taken thus far to hold Russia accountable. And Arizonans are also concerned with the price of groceries and everyday goods, and we're paying too much at the pump right now. So in a global economy, sanctions often involve economic trade-offs. How is the Fed assessing the impact of Russia's illegal war and the U.S. and allied sanctions against Russian banks on the pricing of oil and gas for consumers? Thank you. So uh, oil and gas prices have been going up really for a couple of months now uh, in anticipation of this, and then they've gone up substantially in the last couple of weeks. And, you know, the really important question for the economy is how long that will persist the immediate impact will be to uh, raise gas prices and, and other fuel prices and prices for companies using energy. Uh, and, uh, you know, so inflation will move up. People will feel that, certainly at the gas pump. Uh, and, um, and also, uh, you know, crudely a little bit, uh, you would expect at least a little bit of, of uh, you know, lower economic activity due to higher, higher energy prices. But again, it's both the magnitude of that of that uh, full, you know, and and that that will really depend on events events that haven't happened yet. How big will those increases be? And secondly, how long do they persist? If they if they are brief and and go away, or if or if, or if just the price of oil stays at a certain level for a while, then 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 the effect on inflation will be temporary. 
So we'll be watching all of those things. And, um, you know, we run simulations and that sort of thing. That's, that's one of the things we, we like to do. And so to make ourselves uh, think about, about the, the possibilities, of course, everything is so uncertain. It, it's just very hard to say where this is going. And I think in that environment, we need to, we need to move carefully with our, with our policy. And that's what we're planning to do. How much do you expect these changes in oil and gas prices to affect the availability and pricing of other goods that rely on oil and gas in the U.S.? And do you expect there to be a noticeable impact in the consumer price index? I think temporarily, you certainly you'll see you'll see gas prices move up uh, as they do when oil prices go up, and uh, and that'll show up in the consumer price index. It'll show up in the headline index. It doesn't show up in the core index but it shows up in the headline index. And the headline index, of course, is what people are actually paying at any given time. So mm -hmm. it will show up. Does Russia's war in Ukraine change the Fed's thinking about interest rates? Too early to say. I, I, I do think um, before the um, invasion, we were planning to raise rates this year. We were planning to, uh, to, to make a series of interest rate increases. That is still the case. Uh, I think it right now in this very sensitive time where, where uncertainty is highly elevated and we really don't know which way things are going to go, I think we, we need to move carefully. Uh, but we, we certainly think it's appropriate for us to go ahead uh, with our plan and also our plan to shrink the balance sheet. But just just knowing that we, um, we, we do not want to add to uncertainty. Our, our goal is always to promote financial stability and macroeconomic stability. And that means that at times like this, we, we move carefully. And um, that's what we'll be doing. Mm. Last question. The sanctions on Russia's central bank are also affecting American companies who have holdings in Russia. So what assessments are the Fed making about the impact of American companies' dealings in Russia? And how could the Fed respond to stabilize the markets if that does become an issue? So particularly the large financial institutions, but really American businesses generally, really do not have um, major exposures to Russia. And, uh, and they've gotten less over the years. So uh, the, we're, we, we um, particularly with the big banks, you know, uh, there, there are some meaningful uh, exposures, but they're not large in the context of the overall institution. So um, in, in a sense, the first order effects on the U.S. economy from trade or from investment or from operations on the ground are, are not going to be large. There can be other effects, though, second order effects um, and, 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 you know, unintended consequences and all that. So we're, we're watching the situation very carefully. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I see my time's expired. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Sinema. Uh, thank you to Senator Powell for joining us today. For senators who wish to submit questions for the hearing record, those questions are due one week from today, Thursday, March 10th, close of business. Chair Powell, please submit your responses to questions within the 45 days uh, from the day you receive them. Thank you again for your testimony. The committee's adjourned. <laughs>